call the meeting to order. 332. Um, first up on the agenda is visitors and staff to be heard. And I'm going to ask any visitors who came here to speak um, to the school safety topic to, um, we're going to let you speak just before that topic on the agenda, which is at about 5. So um, if you would hold it until then, I'd appreciate it. And otherwise, do we have any other visitors and staff to be heard? Unless you can't be here at 5 and want to say something. <laughs> That's it. All right, principal's reports. Lori, you want to start us off? And thank you for having us. We appreciate yes. it. We always appreciate the warm welcome from the students. Welcome. We're, we're very pleased to have you here. And I put the, the plea out to see who would like to share sort of what they've been working on. And we really wanted to focus around the technology integration since the board and the community has been so supportive of allowing us to get to where we are with our our one-to-one -one initiative. So that's largely what you're going to hear today is the ways that students are using technology um, within the classroom on a day-to-day -day basis. So I have two sixth grade groups that are going to present a couple of different things that they're working on. Um, I have some seventh graders that are going to share kind of a new project that has to do with foreign language. It's also in conjunction with something that's going on at the high school, which is really exciting. Um, and then we have two or uh, three eighth graders from Team Discovery that's going to share some of the science work that they've been doing. So hopefully we're, we've got five minute limits. We're hoping that people stay to their five minutes. So we'll start with our, our sixth graders. They're going to introduce themselves and just tell you a little bit about what their project was about. Hello. This is the restoration experiment by Sasha Kim Carsey, Mary Finnegan, and Riley Fitzgerald. So we have been studying the carbon cycle, photosynthesis, and respiration in Mr. Burrell's sixth grade science class. And the carbon cycle is one way that energy is trans transferred throughout the, our ecosystem. This is our respiration equation, and then it's like glucose plus oxygen equals carbon dioxide plus H2O plus energy. And then these are just the standards we are working on. Our hypothesis. Respiration occurs more when you are exercising harder, so the temperature slash heat coming from you will rise. What do you think? You want a quick check in to see what people think? <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> Hot or cold? Hot. 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 Um that's one of the go time temperature probes we use to record our data. Um we the kids put the masks on and if you breathe onto it the temperature it would record it on the graph. Yeah. That's cool. Oops, no. Go back. <laughs> <laughs> we also use the HP Munis and the Chromebooks to make this slideshow. And that's when we were doing the experiment, that was the boys, that was the girls. And they utilize the um the the wellness fitness spot that was put together for the faculty and staff that's in the gym, they used that equipment to record this data. So we had three people doing different things. The first person was sitting, and this was the girls. And the second one was pushing the treadmill, and the third was using the elliptical. And none of the um, equipment was on, so we had to push it all ourselves. And we had them put on the mask, and then they, we all rested for like three minutes. And then for the next five minutes, we had everyone exercise except for the person sitting. And we figured out that our hypothesis was wrong. And the more you worked out, the lower the temperature of your breath was. Hmm. Uh, this is the boys. It's the same thing, the same colors for the same vehicles, but. Um, and the treadmill it was little pacing. His breath kept going higher after he started exercising, which was kind of weird, considering the girls' graph. But then it went down. So that made sense. In summary, we discovered that as you exercise and use a food molecules, glucose, the temperature of your breath decreases. We are not sure why. We can revise our original hypothesis too. As you exercise, you burn energy used to make heat in your breath. So your breath cools down as your muscles heat up. 
Thank you, guys. Interesting. Thank you. Thank you. You saw on the slide that they were using both the Vermont science standards, but also starting to incorporate the next generation standards, which are the new standards that um, should be fully implemented across the state within the next two years. Um, we'll stick with our NECAP science assessment for the next three years, and then there'll be a new assessment that will reflect the next gen standards. But we're already starting to, to put that into our, um, our unit planning right now. You guys want to start talking about what it is? Uh, okay. Yes. Yeah. Well, I got logged into show. Technical difficulties. <laughs> okay, so the slideshow that we're about to present is about our Chromebook uses um, in sixth grade. So. And this is Kirsten. Oh, yeah. Hi. Hi. <laughs> So, first of all, if you didn't know what Chromebooks are, they're sort of like mini laptops. They are like they're they're better. They're a lot lighter than like regular smaller laptops, and they and they're you know smaller. Yeah, so in science, um, we've been doing some labs um, and lab write-ups in our Chromebooks. Um, we had to use the leaf paragraph format. Um, LEAF stands for L is your lead, E is your evidence, A is your analysis, and F is your finisher. Um, this, we've also been searching for lab information, and this right here is just an example of some wood densities that we've been doing. Um, so, science. <laughs> <laughs> um, in math, <laughs> right, well, in math, we've been doing sort of like a sometimes weekly little math check-ins to see just so Mr. Karen can you know see what we've been doing and like how well we're doing in this in like a unit and the this is the Denver Blue Bear we um we had to find out if a giant paw print that Mr. Karen cut out a favor fit to the Denver Blue Bear and we used a series of multiple ratios, ratio tables, and rate tables to find this answer out. Um, so we had to go on, like, find information, find the lengths, and we had to find the size of the Denver Blue Bear's paw, which was pretty difficult because <laughs> there wasn't much information on that specific um, idea. Um, um, then we've also been working on IXL.com. This is a language arts and math sort of um, website that you can go on. We've been working on like a bunch of math in it, like for ratios. This was one of our ratio, one of our many many ratio problems. Um, but on IXL, we can just get more practice in. Um, so we also have to assign for homework sometimes, just to you know for practice. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> okay, so in humanities, again, we've been doing leaf paragraphs um, and multi-paragraph responses, as in we've had to write a report about like rainforest and why deforestation should stop. Now, that was just one of our, our multi-paragraphs, and we also had to use a leaf format. Um, we've been using it for research, again, with like rainforest stuff. <laughs> we've, we've been also using Moodle and that's, uh, we've also been using Moodle and almost like, we've been using that in sci um, no, in math also. And that's how we get to our mini tests and check-ins. That's sort of how we go to Moodle and we go to science. No, no, <laughs> we go to humanities or math and we just click on a link and that'll take us to the mini check-ins. Um, we've also used this for almost all classes to sort of like collaborate with each other because we will share doc we'll share documents with each other so we can all work out on the same document at the same time so not so it, we can use multiple computers and it's given me personally a chance to collaborate with other people 
because we don't have to hover over one piece of paper, one piece or one Chromebook. It's more of we can all work on it at the same time. It's really easy to do. So, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Awesome. Very good. <laughs> Good. Thank, Thank you, you, sixth graders. Uh, next up, we have our team discovery science projects, and we have Maya Boyers and Anna Ursini are going to share what they have. And Sid, you're part of this too. synthetic materials so we took a trip down to Maple Street Park and we took some pictures and we put it into a photo story to show how it affects our health. <laughs> Is there anything you wanted to recap out of that? Um, so those were all the pictures that we took and I don't know if you could hear all the explanations, but basically there's many pros and cons to all the different synthetics that we use in our life. So. Do you think there were more pros or cons? Um, Pros. Yeah. That's why we use them so much. Okay. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you.
Thank you. And this is Sid Froelich. Hi, I'm Sid. <laughs> and um, so we did a project on keeping the energy inside of a certain device. So the one that I did was I made an insulator for a coffee mug to keep it warmer because I know the safe it likes her tea. <laughs> and um, it, we used like the engineering process of like making a design and then building it and then refining it. And we also use testing to help create our fine to help answer our questions that she gave us. So my design involved lots of different layers and quilting to keep in the air pockets. And then I did some testing and um, I have three different tables here. This is my first testing with just the regular go cup and then this is the one with my design and this is the difference. So at the end of 15 minutes, my go cup saved 16 degrees of Fahrenheit mm -hmm. in the water temperature, mm -hmm. which I thought was pretty good given that I expected like, negative five. <laughs> <laughs> but um, then we used our, like, our data here to answer our questions and um, there was a certain question called the expanding question and that's what you do to get a really good grade or an expanding which is part of the new grade base using B's and D's and S's and E's which stand for beginning, developing, expanding and securing. So, yeah. Great. Thank you, Sid. Thank Thanks. you. Last, we have our seventh graders that are going to show us a new foreign language opportunity. So this is Lizzie Goodrich, Sarah Combs, and Grady Corkum. Um, okay, I'm Susan Plunkett Dunning. And there's a teacher at the high school, Jill Prado, she was supposed to be here this evening, but she received a Roland Grant to create Virtual Intercultural Avenues, which is a portal for learning French. And when I first heard about it, I said, I want ADL involved. So um, I've been working with her, and we've just begun. This is the VIA website, and um, there's tweeting on there. We don't tweet, but we can read the tweets. Um, we have the blogger, Scopia is, we meet, we haven't done this, but, uh, the teachers we've met face you know, by Scopia um, a couple of times. Hopefully, eventually, we'll be able to do that with the kids. And we've just begun the blogger part. We have our own blog. Oh, I want that show. Um, <laughs> we have our own blog, which I don't know if we're going to get. Oh, where's Indy Glenn leave? Yep. <laughs> oh, now I've lost it. Now I've lost it. No. Oh. All right, so why don't you just explain it? They're going to tell you <laughs> what we're doing at this point. The one, but the important thing I wanted to get in there is that the ADL Cité Collège, which is the name of the school in Narbonne, France, is a private blog to us. And they're going to tell you what it contains. Um, Let's we'll see if I can find it. So we're blogging or making pen pal letters to people in France. Um, so we put up pictures of ourselves and like group pictures of our friends and stuff. And we wrote letters about ourselves to tell people in France what we're all about here. Yeah. Question: Are you are you writing in fr in French? No, no, we're writing in English, and they're writing in French because yeah. we're learning opposite language with each other. Um, and then we have been working also on a PowerPoint project, which is kind of just some pictures around our school. And so, and then we're going to put that on so they can see kind of what our school is like because they sent us a video of their school. And so we're going to kind of show them what our school is like. And the advantage is, and that's too bad we can't show you because the pictures are good, is that when I used to do pen pals, we'd wait weeks for letters and then we'd take us a while to answer. Um, so they, I just, received a response from the teacher. We just posted these. They're going to respond on Thursday. She won't see her students till Thursday. So we should get immediate response and feedback, which will be exciting. Mm -hmm. And the high school's using this as well? The high school is using this as well. Um, maybe we can go. The, there is a main blog, which um, is blocked. 
It must be because it's blocked. You no, know, it's because it's sort through ADL students. That's why instead of instead of through you. Oh, okay. Yeah. Because I am okay. Um, the, the, and well, you guys can, we can take <laughs> sometimes <laughs> log on. There's a main blog and there are several prompts, um, and there are already response for English and those are the high school kids who've been doing that. We're we're going to have our blog is going to be separate. So is it a school. free website? Do you have to? It's free. Yeah. Yeah. We're gonna be like working on a prompt next, which is like stereotypes, and like we're gonna be writing about stereotypes that we have like French people, like the berets and stuff. And they probably write about like how we're so loud and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll, that's where we work on today. And I said this is Sarah Coulter, not Sarah Combs. I don't know why I said Sarah Combs, but thank you guys. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. So those are just some of the ways that we're using the technology here at, at ADL. I, I, we could have had several more. I had several more that responded that we're more than willing to share. But if you walk through the halls at ADL, I mean, the, the entire day, and it doesn't matter if it's at the beginning of the day when kids are going through their, their PE classes or their health classes or their, um, from, from start to finish during the day, they are on the computers working and accessing the technology and it's it's really exciting to walk around and, and watch them. Are they taking any of it home? They take the yeah right. Yep. Yeah. Yep. The All sixth grades? graders no the sixth graders are not taking them home. Um, but we thought we would like make that kind of the training year. So we started the school year with the, actually the Chromebooks living in the classrooms and right. the kids were just taking them out of the classrooms. January they're starting to take them from one class to another class. And then when we come back from the holiday break, they'll start to be able to take them to foreign language, to unified arts, so they can carry them around the building. We thought we'd try to build that, right. <laughs> the capacity, so that as seventh and eighth graders, when they have them all the time and they can be taking them home, that they're maybe not dropping them, which <laughs> would be a really good thing. How, how is that going in the other grades? It's going pretty well. It's definitely better this year than it was last year. Last year, I think we had a lot more that, that got dropped. Um, but we've really been trying to work hard at training them and you know really being on top of it if we see somebody walking around the hallway with the screen up closed gets taken away for a day I mean it's just we're really just trying to stay right on top of it mm -hmm. so that's working out pretty well yeah but we will we can't get the minis anymore so we will have to move to something else the Chromebooks are great but the Chromebooks have some limitations um, you can't use Java with it and a lot of the programs that we like to use with the students have Java so we haven't quite figured that out yet I also have some questions about whether or not SBAC then the new state assessment will be able to be accessed using Chrome books where the kids will run into problems when they're trying to figure out a math program or so we've got a few things that we're trying to figure out um, but there's a good chance that probably we would just start going with Chromebooks across the board if we can figure out some of these other pieces they're much less expensive and the students that use both definitely prefer the Chromebooks they like the lightness of it they like the ease of it right. um, it's very intuitive it's very user friendly so my guess is what you'll see from me in the budget this year will be um, for Chromebooks and, and phasing out the minis would probably be where we'll go so that's the, that's the technology piece. Um, the other thing that I just wanted to share with you is, you know, as you know, we're moving forward on our standards-based reporting. Um, so we did a lot of work over the November break um, and leading up to the November break of trying to have content areas figure out what standards they would want to have on that report card, figuring out what habits of mind we would want to report out on, um, what is it measuring each trimester? Is it a progression from the beginning to the end of the year, or is it sort of a snapshot of where students are at the end of each trimester? So this is a very drafty, 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 drafty draft, <laughs> but I wanted you to have a, a copy of um, the report card that we've, so the, the first, first template, answer. the first attempt, and now we're getting feedback from faculty, staff. We want to show it to some students. Um, I'll be bringing it to a parents as partners meeting in January to share it with them and I've publicized that that's a time where I'll be sharing that um, the report card with them and also a couple of articles about standards based reporting and learning that I thought might give you some good background into why we're making this this particular change um, but I just wanted you to have that ahead of time because as we start releasing some of this 
to families, I wanted you to have a background of sort of what are we talking about, where are we going, give you some chance to, um, to look it over and pose any questions or thoughts you have for me that we can respond to as we continue down that journey. But the plan is for next school year to, to go to completely standards-based reporting. Um, we've also started a, a great conversation around student recognition. What is it that we want to recognize about our students? And how will that look different than recognition has looked in the past year at, at ADL? Because some of the traditional awards that we have here, the criteria doesn't fit with standards-based um, learning and grading anymore. So we've, we've had a, just a really great conversation with it that, um, this past week, a couple of weeks. <laughs> so that's my that's report. Great. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Jen, do you have the other principal report? Yes. So we're very fortunate to have so many things happening in all of the schools. Um, but what I'll do is just touch on one for each school today and some public events coming up in the next month. Uh, we'll start with Hiawatha. Several of their staff members have designed a before school exercise program to support some of their students. And right now I know that there's 13 um, in attendance. That's a Monday, Wednesday, Friday from 7 to 7.45. And they'll um, finish that at the end of December and start another session come January. Um, their first grade team has been organizing their annual hand-to-hand -hand sale, which is going to be Wednesday, December 18th, all day. And the proceeds help out the Heavenly Pantry. Their next PTO meeting will be held on Tuesday, December 10th at 6.30 in the Learning Center. Um, Summit Street School just raised $3,000 um, for their Learning Center as a result of the Scholastic Book Fair. And December 10th, Natural Playground meeting at 6.30 in the Learning Center. On December 18th, they're going to have their sampling day in the lunchroom from the CCSU Food Service Program. And Thursday, December 19th, they'll have an all-school sing at 8.15 in the gym. Thomas Fleming School, their students and staff raised and then donated over $650 to fund an educational scholarship from an orphan student from Africa. Ms. Kelly McClintock, their Fleming um, physical education teacher, was supporting this while she worked there over the summer. This nine-year-old boy will now be able to attend school in his village come January. Um, the mm -hmm. Fleming GOB grade level semifinals are scheduled for Thursday the 12th of December in the Learning Center. The fourth grade team will begin at 10.15 and the fifth grade team will begin at 1.30. And Principal Ryan also wanted to acknowledge the art teacher Lisa Foley for her planning and support of the Kevin Reese Mural Arts Project where 60 Fleming students were involved in this and got to auction off the murals. Um, and again, Kelly McClintock, she's established a new Learning Fit morning program. Students, staff, and parents come three mornings a week to do a dance and workout program to get them their minds and bodies ready for the day. And that's it. Can you come to my house and get me ready? <laughs> <laughs> That'll be good. All right, CCSU board update. Are you doing that, Jenny? Uh, I'm giving that. I'm okay. just going to do an update on uh, <laughs> superintendent search. Right. We've um, picked the um, superintendent search committee, um, and all those names went out about a week ago. Um, I think they'll start up in January, the um, forums. So, and we've had, um, I do want to say that. Uh, we had a little bit of feedback about the criteria for the superintendent wasn't wasn't reported word for word on the survey that they that people filled out and um, I, I don't know if we gave the impression that it was going to be but that that was definitely not the plan I mean we tried to have Brian O'Regan sum it up for us and tried not to miss anything but there was I mean some of the you know, it was just such a mixture of comments and, and to put everyone's comments, you know, they were very, uh, very honest. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so um, I just, I think some of them would have been, you would have been able to tell who made those comments. And so we decided as an executive committee to just have Brian sum those up. We didn't sum them up. We did have, all have access to the actual comments ourselves, but the ones that were published were, were definitely more general. So if anyone has a concern about that, we're happy to talk to you, but it, we had some community pushback that they didn't see their exact comment, and 
that was um, not the intention. So. And then tentative approval of the FY15 as you budget. And we did approve um, tentative, tentatively the FY15 as you budget. Um, thanks to Grant and all his hard work. <laughs> And I think that was about it. We have a few more things from that meeting, but they'll be um, in the reports from the Ward Vet Task Team. Which is communications is up first. So you want to take that, Michael? Sure. I mean, in your in your board notes, there is a, a kind of a report out from our, our last communications uh, committee meeting. Um, one of the significant events that we're that we're working with in, in communications is to use Gmail as a way of, I don't know, I guess standardizing communications, either, you know, board communications, uh, committee communications. Um, so we're not putting out documents necessarily to, you know, people's public accounts. So at least everything goes to, to a Gmail. Um, so all, all board members should have set up their Gmail accounts to this point. If you haven't, then you know, I'm not going to single you out, but you know, make sure you do it if you haven't already. Yeah, Charlie. That's yeah. right. <laughs> Just Charlie. Um, uh, and, and we're basically going to try to pilot how we do the communications. I mean, eventually it's to roll out to every all the committees and all the boards, but we want to see how it, how it goes at first. So we're starting with, um, with Westford Board. And I know we were going to do negotiations, but I thought we were also going to basically keep it within communications and kind of since we're the committee that we would talk about how how all that plays out. Um, was there a third? Well, within communications, um, we're picking up the uh, leaders at work, work task as far as creating new board member orientation. Right. Yeah, as far as that and goes. Trainings. So. And I know, I know. Marla had brought up a question about um, confidential uh, communications, and we were going to talk about that at our next committee meeting, which is tomorrow night at uh, 6.30. Policy? Uh, we haven't met since our, our last board meeting. Right. Our last PC meeting. December 18th. Right. With we're still working on the wellness policy, also right. JIE. I believe it's at six o'clock. Yeah, and we're having a negotiation meeting that night also. Right. So, yeah. so we're <laughs> Did we decide yeah. on that? Yeah, that just yeah. happened today. I know it's happening. So I still don't know what happened. It's just email. Like, <laughs> right, it just happened today. So, um, divide we're going to divide and have two meetings that night. So, a correction in your org notes, um, the negotiations council is meeting December 18th now instead of the 17th. So uh, there still can be a board representative from each of the boards for both of those meetings. And um, the actual uh, proposals were exchanged today electronically. So okay. uh, that work has happened. And December 18th is the next meeting. And leaders at work, there's another correction there. Um, that task team is meeting on Wednesday, December 11th. So getting all these task teams <laughs> aligned has been um, a tad bit challenging, but we're all scheduled and we'll be including uh, minutes um, to your next board meeting. <laughs> We're way uh, ahead. That's okay, because we have Aaron here. <laughs> Aaron, uh, take all the time you need. So Additional preschool partner. Right. Aaron's um, presented the board an opportunity to approve two additional uh, preschool partners through the Act 62, Carolyn's Red Balloon in Colchester and Kinder Start in Williston. Um, and so she's looking for for that to be an action item with approval and is here to answer any questions the board might have about that approval process. And as well, uh, you've received uh, information about a proposal that she's bringing forward to your attention. We thought that first it would be important for you to receive the proposal 
if there's any questions, she'll be available at the January meeting to talk with you about that proposal and answer any questions you may have about that. Um, but if you had any preliminary questions, she can answer them tonight as well. Um, just so you know, for Carolyn's Red Balloon and Kinder Start, we've gone through all of the paperwork review. I've done personal visits to both programs and feel comfortable bringing them both forward. When they applied for partnership, they thought they had children in Essex Junction, and turns out they were from Essex Town. <laughs> <laughs> so right now, they do not have um, kids, but if they did or do soon, then we can use slots to support children in those programs. The more partners we have, the more potential we have for being able to fill all our, our slots. We still have nine slots open right now um, for this year for people who would, um, have children who are three or four years old in preschool and interested in um, participating with one of our partners. We've put that on Front Porch Forum. I've talked about it. Um, at other board meetings, so that's where we stand around Act 62 slots at this point. So seeking approval. Did we increase the number this year? We did. Yeah. We okay. increased by 20. Um, and it actually goes into uh, what one of the reasons for the proposal that you've received. So I can talk about that as well. Do you want to talk well. about that a little bit? Sure. Yeah. Um, I mean, so do you want to? Slots first. Well, yeah, we we'll probably should. Maybe we should do, do the actual slots yeah. first. So approve the so additional partners first. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it'd be Carolyn's Red Balloon and Kinder Start. So, that. so I'll make a motion to accept the. Uh, what's the wording I want to use here? Right. Additional, yeah. additional pre, pre additional preschool partners of uh, Carolyn's Red Balloon and Kinder Start. Kinder Start. Second. Second by Jen. Discussion. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed. Let's approve five or four zero. Great, thank you for that. I'll let those partners know tomorrow. Um, so we haven't filled all of the slots. We did a review, um, a, a community needs assessment prior to increasing our slots, if you'll remember. Um, and one of the things that came forward around that assessment was that uh, we have a number of kids in preschools where they don't meet the standards for partnership um, and so we, and also when we did that assessment um, you received the list of providers in Essex Junction and Essex Town and there were not very many of I think there were like 30 providers and a lot of them did not mm -hmm. meet the criteria for partnership um, so that was, that's one reason why we're moving forward with a proposal to look at a project called Growing Kids Essex Junction. Um, child care resource is um, sort of the hub of birth to five child care and education and early care and education in Chittenden County. Um, they do a lot of work supporting parents and families and identifying um, where uh, their children might be able to go for preschool opportunities. They offer a lot of professional development and a lot of support to preschool and early care providers. Um, and they have done quite a bit of work in another uh, neighboring community around identifying areas of need birth to five in that community and figuring out how to grow both the quality and the ability for partners to part um, for preschools to partner with school districts as well as other barriers or needs that parents may have in the community in supporting the very difficult job of parenting that we all um, know and appreciate and so um, the project is really designed to look at the needs of our community in a much deeper way than the community needs assessment did basically when we did that community needs assessment we looked at how many providers are out there, where are our children, how many kids do we have in this program or that program, what's the history of children coming into our kindergarten as far as where they went to preschool so we knew what kind of connections to make. Um, but we haven't done a deep dig around um, what our community truly values and wants for our um, children ages birth to five. And so a huge piece of this as well as to identify those needs, those interests, what is our mission, our vision. It keeps coming up in different, you know, in the heart and soul conversations and in um, multiple discussions I have regularly 
our birth to five population is the place where 80% of brain development happens in our community. And so children come to kindergarten at five years old and they've been through that already. And so what is our role? What is our um, interest as a community in, in those areas? Um, the second part of the proposal is to pilot a couple of parent engagement sessions around early care and education and to look at um, uh, identifying a center and a couple of neighborhood talks around the topic. So you'll see that as part of the proposal as well. So there's a general study of outreach and looking at providers and parents and community members and community dialogue. Um, and then there also there is this um, parent education and support pilot as part of it to look at what, work, what, what kinds of environments work to reach parents of young children in the community of Essex Junction. So that's sort of the backdrop. The details are in the proposal that were attached to the orgs. Um, and I guess I would um, end just by seeing if there are any questions um, based on what you've heard or what you've read. Again, we'll have another opportunity for questions. And Child Care Resource, who would be helping us facilitate this, wants to come with me um, to meet with you to talk about it. Um, oh, you know what's worth saying, too, is the um, there is a, an um, amount of money that's been budgeted to spend on slots in the current budget that is part of this proposal because we haven't spent the money because we haven't been able to fill the slots. Um, so that's just something else to be aware of. So and we have 100 slots, that, but there's nine that are not filled? We have 60 pre private right. slots, right. and then we have 40 slots in our preschool programs, and nine of the partnership slots are unfilled right now, yes. I definitely think that we need to focus um, first and foremost on that and these Act 62 slots um, and to why they are not being filled. Mm -hmm. Do we need all those slots? Are the, do we have the kids for these slots? Um, and looking at the different preschools around that aren't meeting the criteria doesn't mean they're not a quality um, child care right. place, so they may not just want to participate. So we have to remember that as well. And that's certainly their choice, but I think we owe some outreach to providers in the community to see if there is something that we can do to help support them in being more interested in partnership. I would agree there are a lot of amazing programs out there and they just may not be moving forward with that or not see the benefit in it. Um, and I think that it's, it, it is worth trying to figure out. We do know that, that we have a pocket of centers um, that are interested and just not, you know, they don't have the endorsed teacher or, you know, one of the other quality areas that we might be able to support and then increase support and connection to those centers. The, I think, and part of it is studying this, but I think based on the information I have thus far, it's pretty clear that we have a number of children in centers that are not approved for partnership right now. Some because they may not be interested and some because they wouldn't be able to meet the quality standards if they attempted that and may need some support and some engagement to be able to do that. Um, so I would agree with you. I think that that's an important focus for sure. And we typically have about 100 to 120 uh, Kindergarten. kindergartners sure. enter each year as five-year-olds. So yep. When you did this study about birth, well, three, uh, three and four-year-olds, four mm -hmm. Approximately 220. Yep, it's about 220. And so we are uh, hovering right around 90 mm -hmm. children that we're engaged with, um, and I, you know, I think with some work, mm -hmm. we could reach more. Um, and I also am curious about the perspective of our, our community around birth to five. I mean, I think it's important for us to know that. Um, and and be able to support whatever work might happen in the community and then also whatever work might happen in the school district recognizing that um, you know both are important I, I'm not sure you can do any of it without that community connection and um, the work of other organizations that have those focus points for example birth to three um, is not an area that we hold a lot of responsibility and yet if you think about development it's really critical um, and so um, it certainly has a tremendous impact on schools and and the community whatever is happening at that at that age 
maybe you could speak a little bit too about the legislative focus through the world class education agenda on sure. preschool. Um, so uh, the Vermont superintendents, the Vermont School Boards Association, the Vermont Principals Association, and the Vermont um, Council of Special Education Administrators are all um, collaboratively in agreement with moving forward with uh, access to high quality preschool as a, as a major piece of success in readiness for kindergarten. Um, H270, which is the bill for universal pre-K, will be um, coming out in the legislature probably pretty early this session and um, it has the potential actually to require school districts to give access to any um, child that came forward or family that came forward where there was a partnership and the ability to provide preschool to do so that they wouldn't schools would not school boards would no longer be able to opt out um, and um, it also proposes to set a statewide rate for um, that reimbursement. So um, there's a fair amount coming out of the legislature, certainly the governor's work, um, and there's a grant that's being proposed on um, the importance of providing high quality care and education and supports to children and families age birth to eight and it's sort of extending. Um, I think it's like a $37 million grant that's been proposed um, out of the governor's office to the federal government. Um, so we'll see. I'm not sure exactly when that information is coming back. There's a lot of work going on mm -hmm. right now, and you, you'll hear um, preschool and early care and education coming up um, in many, many environments, um, and it feels important for us to, to also have those conversations. So you all have a lot of time to read the materials <laughs> and <laughs> come up with follow-up questions. We appreciate it, Erin. Sure. Thank you so Thank much. You Thank you. All right. Thanks. Okay. So, um, tonight, as you know, I'm announcing my resignation from the school board. Um, I have to end my term early as I've moved to Essex and I'm no longer a le legal voter of the junction. And I wanted to say I want to thank everyone for allowing me the opportunity to be part of our community in such a meaningful way. I'm a very emotional person, <laughs> so just ignore me. Uh, the support the board has for its budgets is amazing. I mean, the community has. For for the board and its budgets is amazing and I appreciate the community so much that we live in and if there's anything I can do to help in the future um, just give me a call so and now <laughs> you need to discuss um, I have an appointment ready um, or a recommendation for appointment for a board member in the interim of the next three months um, before the April election. Um, I know we had um, a couple of board members who thought we should appoint someone tonight and a couple of board members who thought we should put a posting on the front porch forum. Um, I'm going to tell you that I recommend appointing someone tonight um, between getting someone um, trained and up and ready to go before budget season. Um, the the fact that this is December and we have very few days left before Christmas vacations. Um, I'm not even sure, you know, how personally you would find the time to interview someone. Um, and we've also had initially had two options or two that thought on two people, and the first one has already pulled out saying, "I don't really want to compete for this position." So. Um, either way, <laughs> but that's that's my opinion on the matter, and I'll leave it up for discussion for you all. What you want to do? Well, Marla, I, you, I you believe felt the most everybody knows how I feel. I feel if you just go ahead and appoint someone tonight, I don't know that person. I don't want to do an appointment tonight. I want to meet that person, even if you've got just one person. I want to make sure that what their goals are and what their reason for doing this is. And we have a quorum of the board, mm -hmm. whether you're here or not. Right. We can reorg, we can make our chair, vice chair, clerk, 
So we can do a reorg because you're not going to take a new member and put them in as an officer. So I don't see the timing issue a problem because hopefully the person you get for a few months will run in, in April. For the board, I just think we'll look to the public like we've done something closed and just automatically shove somebody in. And, and my other opinion is if people are intimidated by having to compete and they dropped out, then they're going to be intimidated by budget. They're going to be intimidated by safety and procedures, what we might have to discuss. And I'd rather work with a four-member board. And uh, don't, I shouldn't say intimidated. So if I said that, that's wrong. I think he just had the, well, I don't, you know, if somebody else would wants to do it, then I'm happy to not do it attitude. I think everyone needs to give their thoughts on this. So who wants to go next? Um, I, I guess I, um, with Marla, I don't like rubber stamping something. Yeah, I like know who the person is, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Oh, that's, that's, yeah. I agree with you guys. I think we need to know who this person is and, and about them. And just get some time with them. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, but at the same time, we need to then set up a plan of how we're going to make that happen fairly quickly. All right, that's... <laughs> Um, in terms of uh, a you know offering or announcing it to, to as many folks as we can just in case there is an interest that's hiding out there that we don't know about yet otherwise we, I mean I I'm only aware of the one individual now at this point so it would also be a matter of reaching out to that person to say here's what we're we're looking at and that person is here, <laughs> which we, uh, he's prepared to talk or not, I believe, but whatever you think is appropriate. I wasn't sure what you were going to decide, and I didn't want him to miss the opportunity to be here. I just don't want you to plan on me appointing somebody tonight. That's fine. Should we mm -hmm. you have any guidance there? I think we have somebody interested and he's here tonight. It's a great opportunity <laughs> since there's uh, like 15 school days before whomever uh, is appointed um, has the opportunity to start to understand um, the budget. Um, and I think that uh, this is a three month appointment. The PC, according to your charter, has the authority to make such an appointment. Um, I can appreciate feeling rushed on it, but at least having the opportunity tonight to meet someone and then scheduling possibly a follow-up. Um, communications team tomorrow night will be looking at what we have in place for new board member orientation and your heads up definitely prompted me to get to work on that <laughs> pretty quickly. Um, so there's two sides to this one is um, you know having time to get to know somebody and and the second piece is having somebody in the best position to add to the board and to complement the work of the board so however you want to uh, proceed I, I think I would love to have an opportunity here okay so Matt you want to join us <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know how to pronounce your last name, but you can come sit up the... Mayley. What is it? Mailey. Mailey. Oh, it's a good thing I didn't try that. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so this is Maddie's, my recommendation for appointment to the board. Um, everyone has his little meet Matt summary. Um, I fir mes first met Matt last year at our community safety forum. He was interested in serving on the board, but declined to run in last April because he wanted to take the time to get to know the community and the members of the board that he would s be serving with more. And he also wanted to make sure he could fully commit. And to paraphrase what he said to me, you know that when the day comes that I pick up a petition, I'm serious about it. Um, I think Matt has a good idea of the commitment and heart it takes to be on the board. I think he'd be a great addition. And he has two young children, one in the school system and one will be in the school system next year, and a very strong background in education. 
and not to put you on the spot too much, but <laughs> do you have anything else you want to say? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you can highlight just in case the Yeah, and so just walking through, um, we've been in Vermont uh, just now a couple years ago. We moved up here. My wife actually took a position at Champlain College, and that's when we moved up here. Um, and after a very thorough search of where we should final s finally settle, um, after taking a year to do that, we settled in Essex Junction for many reasons. Um, one of those for sure being the schools um, with their having our two children and so I have a great passion for that and grew up as a in a family of educators so I have a like a obviously a steep background in education and that's my professional work as well is to work with um, teacher education programs and now graduate programs in education so uh, aside from that uh, I just um, the opportunity here of course is just to um, have a um, an important to serve an important role for moving our schools forward and keeping them um, advancing as well as they have over the over the many years um, and as I learn more and more great things about the um, schools here in town and uh, the work of this committee um, or this board it's just an amazing opportunity to have an impact on the positive you know, development of the community. I have, I have a question on this little blurb we've been given. Mm -hmm. It says here, he is an associate professor and academic coordinator for field-based graduate programs in education for Southern New Hampshire University? Yes, ma'am. Uh, my office is in Colchester, Vermont. Okay. Uh, yeah, Southern New Hampshire University, um, we operate a Vermont campus, and in Vermont it's all field-based education programs, so we don't have a... Um, we don't have a physical campus. We have offices here in Vermont, but we deliver all of our programs on site. So we deliver them in cohort models around the state, in different parts of the state. And with all the other things you're in, how many, how, how, what's your availability to put towards board meetings? I wouldn't be here if I didn't feel I was available and know the board schedule and be available for um, as much as that is possible. I mean, there's, you know, I do have courts across the state, so it's possible that on an occasion. Um, a very small percentage of occasions there might be something else that uh, would prohibit me from attending but that would be I mean, very seldom because I have a great I'm essentially have control over that, that work schedule there's nothing out there that I don't have direct control over when things happen in the evenings and afternoons okay. especially any else? Okay. Um, were you looking to just fill in or would you be running come the next election? Um, my intent would be to step in and then run in the election as well, um, unless you scare me away. <laughs> <laughs> Very scary. <laughs> Nothing? Okay. So we appreciate you letting us put you on the spot no, and, no, um, yes. and hope you understand that just in the, for the community's sake, that we'll probably put something on Front Porch Forum within the next couple days Absolutely. and then schedule something with you formally maybe to Absolutely, we'll have it any other way. And thanks for okay. support. I think what's nice. on this piece of paper would intimidate anybody else <laughs> coming forward, so I don't think you got a problem. <laughs> and, and just to make sure, you didn't you didn't attend Ohio State, correct? Oh, yeah, he's a Buckeye. No, uh, I forgot to first tell you. It's, <laughs> it's, I forgot to tell you he's a Buckeye. It's the Ohio State out. University. <laughs> <laughs> Let's make sure it's always the Ohio State University. The Ohio State University. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sorry, yeah. 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 No, no, it's, it's, it's just, it's right just Ohio, Ohio State. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. So. I, went, I went to Wisconsin, so. Oh. Yeah. You can tell the value of sports in this community. <laughs> <laughs> All he cares about is they beat Michigan. That's right. That's so sad. That's <laughs> sad. <laughs> All right. Thanks, ma'am. Oh, thank thanks. thanks. So Michigan just to follow up a little bit yeah. on that, Charlie, when do you think, um, who's going to be the contact person from the um, when you post on the front porch form? Just so. <laughs> and who, who's going to do the posting? Just some of those details, and maybe we can just talk offline um, after the meeting. But I just want to do whatever I need to do to support. Yeah, I would think direction. Michael as vice chair would be most yeah, appropriate, unless probably. you all have some other Are ideas. Are we board reorging tonight? No. It, yeah. Well, not without. It, you need a board chair and a vice chair. Right. Oh. So, what we usually do at annual meeting is the superintendent. Uh, is the person who takes a gavel for a moment and opens up the floor to accept any nominations for the chair of the PC board. So do you want to do that before the school safety 
discussion? Yeah, we can do it now. So are there any nominations? I okay, nominate Mike as chair. So he Marlo likes punishment. <laughs> Mar Marlo uh, nominates Michael Smith and seconded by David Reister. Are there any other nominations? Hearing none, I'll call the question. All those in favor of Michael Smith being the PC chair, say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 4-0, and so Michael, I'll give you back the gavel now to open <laughs> up nominations for vice chair. Okay, so now we have an opening for vice chair. Do we have any, any nominations? <laughs> Who wants it, Jenna or Dave? <laughs> I'm not, I'm not looking Marla. to take it. If no one else will take it, I'll take it. I, I prefer not to. But <laughs> <laughs> Are no, you, I'm well, happy you, being <laughs> Clark. I guess I'll nominate Dave Reister. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not second. <laughs> Michael Smith nominates David mm. Reister. Second. Any second. I will second that. Jen seconds. You sure? You don't want to? <laughs> Jen Ash seconds. I guess the Any? only question Ooh. I would have before we vote is will you be able to make agenda meetings, daytime meetings with Mike and go over agendas? What's the, regular, what's the uh, occurrence of those? A week before Essentially this. Uh, a week to 10 days before the meeting for the oh, actual schedule oh, okay. meeting. It's, it's just once a month or, yeah. Yeah, okay. you know, as often as we have a meeting. Is it, ever, what, is it set day already? Um, I don't know how far we had them scheduled out. Okay, I mean, it's not like Tuesday, like, like, you know, I have a Tuesday, so it's not Tuesday. Yeah, all time. Okay. yeah. okay. But we tra generally try to do it, like, first thing in the morning. They get me up really early, like 7.30. <laughs> That's usually too I'm usually going back to bed. <laughs> <laughs> but but we can okay. I, I yeah, think it's okay. <laughs> but we can work out a, a, a schedule between yeah. you me and, and Judy to hammer something out that works really well for the three of us. Okay. So any other nominations? I'll be the very interim. <laughs> any discussion? Any other further discussion about Dave as the uh, nominee? Would you like to give a speech? No. <laughs> <laughs> I refuse to interview. <laughs> so then, all, all those in favor as uh, Dave Reister as the uh, mm -hmm. vice chair, say aye. 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 Any, any opposed? <laughs> I abstain. So, 4 0. Mm -hmm. I get to vote still. Can I? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Did we accept your resignation? December 31st. <laughs> but I'm happy, that's fine. <laughs> All right, five zero. <laughs> Should the votes be five zero? zero? <laughs> <laughs> I guess so. Um, and then, do we need to do clerk since that position wasn't Didn't vacated? Change. Yeah, I don't think it was vacated. Unless, unless Jennifer so unless, would like to do it. Unless Marley would like to, <laughs> so you'd like to uh, resign your you. position as clerk and, and open Jennifer. it up for uh, mm -hmm. Jen. <laughs> Okay, then I think I think we're we're pretty set. Um, committees that you were serving on, right? Um, I wrote that down somewhere. So leaders at work. If you're on the board till the thirty first, would you be able to make the leaders if, at if work this Wednesday? If you want me to, Wednesday? that was going to be my question. Because the consistency, we're mm -hmm. at the tail end of the superintendent evaluation model and discussing it yep so if nobody has an objection yeah that's what I was gonna ask you that because I told him I was available but I wasn't sure okay. if you wanted me so I your did. resignation doesn't take effect until December 31st right. so you can still serve on task teams right and vote tonight okay just for clarity All right. good I just say no if between this meeting and reason. after the resignation, if there's meetings for anybody else or any of those right. teams that you're on. Just leaders at work. Okay. But the guess. vice chairmanship is effective immediately, though. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Apparently so. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't think we got to vote on that one. <laughs> um, 
think that's it then. Yeah. Is that it? So, so should we, we go to the consent agenda? I was going to suggest yeah. that oh, while I forgot you're waiting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we can move on to the consent agenda since we're a little bit ahead of time. Right. So I would need a, um, a motion to approve uh, the consent agenda, which includes warrants, meeting minutes of uh, 14 October, uh, fiscal year uh, announced tuition, amendment for the PCEJ Select Board. And I brought a clean amendment. Okay. Um, PJRP preschool relocation. Uh, should I name the uh, the letters of resignation? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Approval of uh, Mark Brislin's letter of res resignation from EJRP and approval of Charlie Day's letter of resignation from the uh, Prudential Committee, as well as approval of the bank resolution. Before. Before we discuss anything, because I don't want to pull the letter, you said you had a clean copy of that amendment. Yeah. Charlie, uh, in review of the, did you at least get a, uh, no, in review of the uh, agreement found an error in the, in the letter, it's on page two. So the cr the cr I just handed you the corrected copy, whereas instead of saying on the second page, fourth line, um, it said semi-annual. So we oh, right. took that out and it just says annual. It's just annual now. And there was also a strange marking after the C. Was it was Marla that brought it to my attention. Yeah. So. Oh. <laughs> oh, it was Credit Marla. to Marla. Oh, I understand now. I did my, I did my homework. Nice as job. Clark, as Clark, I did my homework. <laughs> <laughs> well, good. So, okay, so that is a fresh copy for um, Michael to sign tonight, um, if you approve it. So did, was there a motion? Not yet. Oh, okay. Yeah, Marla was asking a clarifying okay. question. Yeah, because I didn't want to pull the whole right. thing. So, yeah. Thank you for finding that. And preschool relocation? Yes. Just a question on that. That's mm -hmm. going to take up both rooms over there. So, for tonight, you're only voting on um, the first request, the first part of that proposal. And that uh, is only for yeah. Park Street North. So um, typically EJRP in the summer moves their preschool program to Park Street North because of the amount of work that's going on uh, for programming during the summer at EJRP. So the uh, proposal states that Brad would like to make that move permanent. So it's just moving that program permanently to Park Street North. The second proposal is if we can find conference room space and it's something under consideration that you're not voting on tonight. It did give you a two-step proposal. The concept of moving to Park Street South and using all of Park Street for student programming um, and dividing the program to three and four year olds and four and five year olds. So all we need tonight is approval for Park Street North um, for a permanent location for EJRP preschool program. That help? Yes, I thought we were voting on everything and yeah. I wanted to make sure you had a conference room yeah. to use. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> Okay. So I guess I still need a motion. I'll make a motion to approve the warrants on the consent agenda. I mean, approve the consent agenda. <laughs> it includes warrants, meeting minutes. Of 10, 15, 14, 13. Of 10, 14, 13. FY 15 announced tuition. Amendment for PC. I don't think she can hear you. EJ, the warrants. I'm just listing warrants. Select board. Approve EJRP preschool relocation. Approval of Mark Brislin's letter of resignation. Approval of Charlie Day's letter of resignation. And approval of the bank resolution. Okay, so I have, I have a motion. Do I have a second? 
Um, second. I'd like to remove the EJ RP relocation. I think that needs more so discussion. I think once you move on this first part of it, the second part's already done. So I think we need more discussion on this before we vote on this. Okay, so now I guess. So I'd where like where, where does that go in? Is that after the second? So Charlie uh, can withdraw or amend her motion to say after the removal of the EJRP's preschool relocation. So I'll, I will do that. I will amend to remove the approval of the EJRP preschool relocation. I mean, I, this is the you know, first I heard about it, really. Agenda. So I, I, mm -hmm. I, I think it's That's okay. too many questions to do. Okay. So Marla, do you still second me? With the removal? Oh, yes. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Any any further discussion? Okay. All those uh, in favor of approving the consent agenda as as motioned, aye. say aye. 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 So five zero. So just because I don't want to forget, the bank resolution needs to be signed, Marla, um, because you're the clerk in the presence of a notary, and I have uh, Paul O'Brien here to witness your signature. So do I need to go where Paul is? Paul will come to you. <laughs> make this very official on camera, the signature by the notary. <laughs> and while that's taking it's place, um, Brad's here, so he can answer any questions you might have about the proposal now, if, if that's helpful at this time. Uh, yeah, can we could start the discussion on that. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that'll be sufficient. You want some clarity. You right. don't have to, you know, just sure. Brad's here in the house. Thank you for coming, Brad. Um, they pulled the proposal from the agenda just because it's the first they sure. have seen it and don't really want to make a decision without some discussion first. Yeah. Brad, what is the wait list? Do you think you could get those 16 kids if there was a second classroom? Yeah, we do, and I think... I'm not sure if you already went over the agenda item with Aaron McGuire. We did. Yeah. Um, so, you know, there's clearly a demonstrated need no, for additional preschool space, quality preschool space um, at a relatively inexpensive. Um, so if we if we had both rooms, we think we definitely could fill both. Um, certainly the request right now for tonight was just to get approval to move into the north room. Um, you know, we use it in the summer months and it's been successful and, um, you know, to, to get over there, to not have to, it's really about tearing down and, and rebuilding a classroom each year, you know, it's, um, it's just, it's a lot for our preschool coordinator to deal with and it's transition for kids too, to, to a new space and new, new classroom each year. So, um, her first priority was to try and be in one space permanently year round, um, but we'd love to expand in time. Uh, would any of those slots be open to the Act 62? Would we be able to add any more because you guys are a partner? So we could. Yeah. Yeah, they would all be Act 62 eligible. So we could fill our slots. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. Is there any um, modification needed to the, you know, the way the rooms are set up now? Um, nothing structural. Um, or for, or just for safety compliance or whatever. No, the, the space is already licensed because we license it for the summer use. Um, there might be some small things we want to do over time, you know, in terms of like having a, a sink instead of just a right. hand sink. Yeah. yeah. Um, but nothing that we would alter the, the rooms or in any way. Not even the bathrooms? Because aren't the little kids need a smaller, shorter toilet? Or, uh, or they just need uh, some sort of step stool or whatever to get up to the toilet, okay. which is which is more typical. We fortunately okay. have a small one in our space, but they also go into the regular bathrooms and use those. Okay. So there's no displacement of anything else right now by letting them go into north. Because I say, you know, once they go north, I think it's <laughs> de facto that they're going to go to the south. So mm -hmm. that's why I want to say, you know, what's, what's the impact to well, the right. for South? Currently, North is used for uh, professional development training sites for vertical teams for the curriculum work and with um, other professional development opportunities throughout the SU. So typically, the people who book it the most would be Erin McGuire for some of the training she does and Amy Cole. 
So that's why it would be difficult to think about not having any space, but we would still have um, Park Street South where we have our ELT meetings and the board meets as well currently when we're not in a school. SU board meetings as well. SU. Mm -hmm. Now there are these little alternatives available as needed. You know. What I'm mean, asking is because we're not going to incur any cost to have to go you know, rent a place for meetings now, are we? Or um, you'd still have Park Street South. That's why. We right, but I'm saying, but inevitably, I think the you know the goal would be to use Park Street South for preschool also. Right. We can't make that decision until we work out all the questions you're asking right, right now. Right. Right. <laughs> well, saying, well. Right. That's why I'm having a hard time voting for North because I think once you do North, I think we've already committed to allowing them to grow into the South. At least, at least that's why I'm looking at it. It's. Is that true? Yeah. Is that well, he wants to approve both. Yeah. Well, <laughs> no. <laughs> your long-term goal is that. So, like, okay, so I'm going to say, well, no, I'm not going to support your long-term goal, right? I, I don't. Well, I think it would give us <laughs> a year to plan around conference room space. One of the things, you know, I mean, you all know that Summit and Hiawatha uh, are also challenged for space as well. So you'd only have ADL. Um, this space and um, Fleming, but also you know it'd be a question of talking uh, with U46 board about scheduling our SU board meetings there, and if there are any PC board meetings. Brad talked about possibly using the space that's currently preschool at EJRP for some of those meetings because that's still under your jurisdiction. So there's there's a space of swapping mm -hmm. opportunity. Seeing as Dave um, said something that little bell went off, budget grant, do you have to change some budgeting numbers? Is this going to affect, I mean, EJRP is going to move over to that space, and is there, do we have to decide who's paying for that space? Is there going to be a cost to EJRP for the rest of the year? Not unless you specifically decided you were going to charge because it's kind of it's kind of funny. We haven't really we didn't really contemplate this kind of a scenario when we built the facility use policy. The facility use policy basically mm -hmm. allows for recreation to use school EJ facilities at no charge. So, I mean, so the automatic answer would be, no, there's nothing I would need to do for the budget because right now nobody's charged for Park Street North and nobody would be. If you decided you wanted to make recreation pay for Park Street North, um, I'd have to look to see whether that would require us to waive policy in order to create mm -hmm. an agreement so that you could charge rec. I mean, that would be something you could think about. As far as the budget, immediacy of the budget, I mean, I don't need to know that. I can, that would just be an added benefit of having the revenue in the school district, so it's not going to slow me down from doing the budget at all. But it's something you can think about is, do you want to charge, and if so, you could let us know, and administration can go back and try to figure out what things we'd have to do in order to have that occur. Are we given any reimbursement from CCSU for using that building for conference? No. No. So. Does ACE pay rent? ACE does. Well, what I'm saying is you know, now we're having a building that EJRP is subsidizing the use for for things that are not directly currently under our domain, right? We, we, we don't do ACE and we don't do EJRP's rec program. So we're now paying for the upkeep of that building because EJRP owns that building. Is that correct? Uh, Park Street School? EJSD. Yeah. I mean, excuse me. I'm, you right, own it. right, we own it. Right, PC. Right. So PC is now paying for the upkeep of that building. Right. Mm -hmm. And have been. So I, I think somehow that cost has to be shifted to EJRP and ACE. Otherwise, we're subsidizing preschool at EJRP, and I don't think that's the role of PC. ACE does pay. Right, so right, that but that's only part, yeah. that's part of it. So I, right. I, think I think it's, if memory serves, I think ACE pays $10,000 a year to use both rooms upstairs. Mm -hmm. So if you were going to carry that model forward, then I guess you would be contemplating a $5,000 a year charge mm -hmm. for recreation. You know, I, I'm looking at you know, prior preschools who are going to say, geez, you give me free space, I would take that. Mm -hmm. You know, 
we're creating a non-competitive situation here. I don't, well, I don't like that. Anymore. The other issue is EJRP is uh, funded in part by taxpayer money, which is determined differently than the school district mm -hmm. monies. So public, when they get up, they're always looking for those cutoffs and question if it gets controversial, they can question those kind of things. But I don't want to affect any program this year or charging them because it, when I read Brad's um, thing, he'd be willing to let us use the rec department for school board meetings or other things. So I don't mind approving this tonight with the caveat that we would discuss it further and uh, resolve where the conferences would be held and how the money would work. But I don't see it as having to be resolved tonight. I think we can wait to the next school year. For the next second part of the proposal, you mean? Mm -hmm. I, I, That's I appreciate that motion because I think that we'd have to, um, we have to study every meeting now that takes place there to see the feasibility about whether we can um, support both rooms. So I, I don't think we're ready to approve both rooms. I know we're not ready to approve both rooms, but, but I, I think uh, a permanent location for EJRP preschool at Park Street North at least puts a program in that, that building as well, and it's utilized more for the community's children. I do want to look at it in the future, though, because after our last CCSU meeting, mm -hmm. I apologize I got here late because of work, but with us spending a half hour or longer discussing in a CCSU meeting, putting $800 in for a clerk or mm -hmm. uh, someone like Denise to do the minutes, that I think it's only fair if they're going to discuss and get that specific. Mm -hmm. and give a rough time on adding $800 for something like that, then I think we need to talk about CCSU reimbursing if they're going to use conference space. I, you know, that's, I don't mean to be that way, but it mm -hmm. was such an awkward conversation <laughs> and it was a waste of our time and our evening. Mm -hmm. And I just... I don't know how to make them realize that we've got to stop that because then I want to look at taking 800 from them, you know, or vice versa. Could, could you maybe, um, for tonight's issue, could you maybe just approve use of Park Street North by the Rec Department contingent upon resolving fee structure, <coughs> the mm -hmm. potential fee structure? Can I just ask one more question? Um, but are there a lot of things taking place at EJRP on that room um, at nighttime? Uh, in the preschool room or in the other room? The other room. In the other room, yeah. The other room has programming pretty much throughout the day. So we would go to the preschool room for meetings? Is that no, what it would be? Well, you, for tonight, we're just talking about the Park Street North. So you would still go to Park Street South for your meetings. Okay. Right. And we wouldn't do anything about Park Street okay. South, opening <laughs> that up until we have we have a lot of concerns about where we would have many meetings right. and voting okay. more. So right. I would say so we just table that, that, and it's not that's not what was described in the consent right. agenda, I don't think. No. Um, so we can talk about that, and, and there's a lot of questions we need to iron out before we, before okay. we do that. So it's really just uh, approving use of Park Street North by the Rec Department, contingent upon resolving a potential fee structure. And okay. Dave. Just to a couple of your points, we would we would absorb any custodial costs or anything if we were in the north room. So, um, whatever, however often we had a custodian come, we would absorb those costs. Right. right. It's just generally just the building, the, the heating, sure. air conditioning, whatever it is, the you know upkeep of the building. It's now going to take more, you know, more um, use. Mm -hmm. So, I don't think PC should be paying for that. It may be small dollars amount, but it, I think it's the principal thing of keeping things separate, right? That's the problem. That, that's some of the problems we run into here that we oversee EGRP. I think there's a going back and forth sometimes of things that. You know.
So Mr. just grant recommendation uh, with the contingent upon an examination of the fee no schedule work? Or did yeah, you have I, I'm question? fine with that. The only other statement I want to make, seeing as we're discussing this, is it's obvious we have a shortage of space in the schools, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which maybe we haven't increased huge numbers of students, but the needs of the students have changed, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. we, we have put off studying that. And I think we have to really get on top of that. I agree. Yeah. I agree. Okay. So, <laughs> so what's the motion? Aren't you glad you're <laughs> chair today? <laughs> so I, I, I am. Yes. So I, I guess we're looking for a motion mm -hmm. to approve the, uh, the relocation of the uh, EJRP preschool to Park Street North contingent upon a a fee structure, you know, examination, essentially. Right, that's, that's, that's a, okay. So, I need a motion like that. So moved. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. And a second by Dave. Any uh, further discussion? Okay, all those in favor of uh, that motion? Aye. Say aye. 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 Okay, so the motion passes 5-0. Thank you. And we can discuss during budget development. I can maybe throw something in there to discuss you know, what the revenue should be. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So. Okay. Next up is a uh, a discussion on school safety. I'm going to let Charlie in her, her last meeting kind of facilitate this discussion. Okay, so at our previous meeting we heard from um, Mr. Frank Puglio a request that we consider some safety upgrades to our schools including immediately locking all the main doors during the school day um, in our Essex Junction schools. Uh, we want to again thank Mr. Puglio for bringing this to the board. We recognize how important it is to keep revisiting this subject, not just when there's a tragedy, mm -hmm. but also, um, you know, superintendents change, teachers change, police chiefs change, mm -hmm. board members change, and, and so I think it's definitely a discussion that should just always be ongoing. Mm -hmm. Um, we recognize that nowhere is 100% safe, but it is important to keep the conversation open with teachers, admin, police, parents, public officials, and everyone who will be called upon to respond in some way as well. Um, we invited Sergeant Steve Otis, who is a member of the Vermont Tactical Team, to come and discuss what's being done nationally and best practices. We invited es Essex Police Chief Brad LaRose, who chairs the Essex School Safety Committee, as well as he's obviously our police chief, <laughs> and um, Tim Vincent from Visbit, who recently conducted a safety audit in each of the Essex Junction schools. And before we have um, Sergeant Otis start, we're going to ask for visitors to be heard. Um, but Judy, do you want to add I just something wanted to, this to add discussion? that John. Uh, Tim Vincent isn't available tonight, but we have Lyle Smith with us. Oh, sorry, Lyle. Um, it, it was because <laughs> of uh, weather. And uh, so there's a correction to um, the person from Visbit presenting. And I also just wanted to say um, that currently um, our schools are a reflection uh, to date as far as what the community has told us about safety and safety in our schools. Um, as the new request has come forward, it's time for the board tonight to hear from the experts that have been invited about um, what has changed and um, to not make any decisions tonight, but just to listen um, and learn about what, what changes could be feasible and possible for consideration. <coughs> um, and then the harder part, which is for the board then to um, listen to your broad-based community as far as what the community in general wants for its schools in respect to safety. So any changes that are made really need to be vetted on a broader scale. Um, and we need to think, as a board, you need to think about how you would 
how you would collect that information and what vehicle could help inform the community's values um, and certainly safety is a top value in this community and safe schools is a, a concern that we always continuously should be having these conversations so okay. so and we appreciate everyone's attendance are there any visitors to be heard on this subject you can join us at the table if there are no. there's okay. also several chairs over here if people want to come and sit down there's all kinds of places to sit down up here comfortable chairs too <laughs> so sergeant otis you want to come join us at the table and sure Thank you for uh, vetting the interest to uh, get some feedback on obviously school safety. With the Department of Public Safety and the State Police, our goal has always been to, you know, have that outreach not only with the law enforcement but also the community what we serve in Vermont. And realizing that this is not just a local police department's issue or a state police issue, it is a law enforcement issue across the country that we're dealing with. And every change or, or modification of policy or procedures within schools varies a lot by state and it's really it's funny you say it, the reflection of the community the schools really are a reflection of the community and how you address this problem is, is almost the same reflection it's really what the community wants and what the school will support for those changes um, to increase the safety of the students and the faculty and of anybody attending these schools um, I know the chief is very much involved with the uh, um, emergency preparedness of the, of the city and the town um, and probably whether that's already been vetted through emergency management or not um, through uh, Department of Public Safety we have a lot, a lot of programs and a lot of interest in the emergency management program that covers school resources and avenues that are available to schools um, for any type of situation not just an active shooter but a very large-scale response to a fire or, or an outbreak of something or, or any type of emergency flooding or what have you um, primarily state police has always taken a motion of uh, training law enforcement with active shooter or active response to an emergency we've done that now for several years recently we're starting to shift gears on the demands uh, of the public making requests to say how can we prepare ourselves as a community for that window while we're waiting for law enforcement to arrive so there are a lot of programs out there nationally um, as far as being provided by a law enforcement agency hasn't really gotten to that juncture yet because those responses are very different between how law enforcement would respond and how we've been teaching for years to how you know teacher or students locked in a school might respond to any type of those situations and again I look back as that is a reflection on the community and what you want from your folks, what you have for expectations of building egress. And, and you know, it's, it's all those things that are concerns for the community that have to be addressed individually to what fits you folks, and what fits the people that you serve. We've seen everything from, as you can see across the nation, from magnometers, magnometers from entry to school, to officers in the school, to something as easy as a, an ID badge where any person comes in the door is getting a visitor pass. They have to come in or out that same door, so they're checked in, checked out. There's some schools across the nation that haven't changed much since Columbine back years ago, and that's unfortunate. Um, but I'm, we're here tonight, obviously, because that, that's not the same here, and there is, there is that change in need to happen. So are there some best practice standards through that the Vermont State Police were the top um, It's hard for us to give a cookie cutter mm -hmm. response to all, all those questions because what might be right for Essex may not work for Vernon, Vermont. And you know the chief is probably the guy that's really going to know the ins and outs of the community and what kind of uh, methods are going to best serve the school. And, and your folks because it's going to be varying for us again we're, we're 
kind of on the outside and usually at, at the request of the chief if he wants access to the state police whether it be a tactical unit or whether we train for his officers or, or what have you we offer those services statewide um, but they really know the school we're really you know an extra tool for them on their belt to use when needed we may have some of the experience you know myself and sergeant lamoth is here we're both on the tactical team so we see everything from the law enforcement side and from the the SWAT team per se side of things and that's how we train officers across the state and that tactic we provide is the same tactic throughout the state and utilized by every officer throughout the state to go on the civilian side like you folks are, are asking and talking about here it's a very different aspect a very different role um, and how we could see what would work here may not work somewhere else whether it's securing doors whether it's only letting one door in or out whether it's only certain hours of the day you know that those crucial times that we've seen over the years have usually been the beginning of school or at the end of school when there's control semi-controlled chaos hopefully with everyone arriving and leaving from school that leave a pretty big opportunity of that school is no longer locked no matter how much you try mm -hmm. and the commitment of the community and also the school is that secured building during the day if that's the avenue you go is only as good as the lock that you use and nationwide they have plenty of agencies that put on um, trainings for schools and other large businesses that have the same concerns of their employees and it's simple turning of a lock is something that some folks just don't do unfortunately and it's it's not a very secure system in that way and that's why it has to be a commitment across the board it can't just be a policy that isn't used or isn't enforced it has to be something that's adhered to if it's actually going to work again hopefully we'll never have to test that again in Vermont to see if that policy does work but if it does at least we'll have things in place to put us out on the positive side of things so specifically to locking the doors um, do you have pros cons can you give us both sides of the argument there obviously locked door is some people cringe mm -hmm. you know what if a fire happens what if it's you have to have a different response to each emergency for an active shooter a locked door may be throughout the building is perfectly fine but in the same breath if that active shooter suddenly turns into a, a large fire or a chemical being expelled in a science class very different response you want people out of the building versus in the building so it's having the staff and having the children and having the people that you serve aware of the different responses and that's why I say no cookie cutter response can fit all categories mm -hmm. because there are varying responses to each one of those situations um, that are going to depend upon locked doors and if if you don't plan if you don't train if you don't talk to your people and talk to your children that's how these things end up not working correctly and there is a, there's a training window to that and it's what's accepted by again by the community and by the folks that are here in the school as to a practice that we do or we don't do and how do we utilize it and how do we enforce it and how do we properly respond to each different scenario the schools that you see locked doors in are is it typically you can't get in but you can get out or are you locked yes. in can't get out normally you can't get in from the outside is the one the ones that I've seen that have committed to the lock is all all doors um, and just you know sitting out here before the meeting there are a lot of doors people are just walking freely and again I look at that after hours where it's very difficult to control people right. and, and it's it's understandable it's a school it's a public building you don't want to have bars on the windows and police officers at the gates I, I totally understand that um, but it's that gray area especially during the school day of folks coming in through that one entry are they being identified? Are they having to check in? Are they having to be uh, issued a visitor tag so they're plainly visible at all times as to who's who in the building? So if a teacher sees someone walking through the building without a visitor tag, then that next outreach has to be the policy says you have to identify that person. It's your job or it's your responsibility to identify who that is. You know, so it's the locked thing is effective but it's only again affected by that lock that's either locked in the science wing and opened up the doors propped open because they're working with chemicals that day and it's no longer a locked facility or the the, the door on the outside of the gym on the janitor side of the building is always open because it's just easier because they bring deliveries in and out you know most of the active shooters that we've researched and have part of our program 
the person knows the building 95% of the time. And those are the folks that are, know situations or areas or, of concern, um, easier ways of, of entry to avoid those locked areas if they know that's what's going to happen. I think in most of our schools, every door is locked but the front door, correct? Except I'm assuming after school. Right, but I during mean, school, school hours. Which we also have to think about because we have village kids mm -hmm. in the field schools. And, you know, goes on. I have a question about locked doors from something, question you asked. So a lot of the classrooms have a separate door to the outside the door into the classroom, a door outside. So if the kids are locked in, and usually from what you see on the news, the shooters are people that the school knows, personnel knows, or what happens if a child in a classroom recognizes someone and open, they can open that door, right? Mm -hmm. So it's inside. not a guarantee, locked doors are not a guarantee that you're providing the safety unfortunately in this world that there are in situations like this and emergencies like this there are no hard guarantees because there are too many aspects that aren't feasibly able to be planned for um, it's just it just we, we could what if as we do with the tactical side of things with the police response we what if it constantly to try to evolve our program to meet changes um, changes of schools changes in security changes in building codes and and uh, construction to meet our response um, because no it's not the same everywhere it's different it changes all the time it's you, you can't plan for situations like that you know but that's, that's another part of this is is to be able to have in place a a peer uh, I don't know I'm gonna call it support but the ability of a peer a student a child echoing that concern of another student those are the things that we're seeing grow over the country, a lot of these situations are being stopped in the, in the planning stages because schools have adopted more of an open door, open ear policy with students saying, hey, if you're hearing that Johnny Jones is having a, an issue and is talking about guns and is talking about planning and he's looking on the internet, then the other child needs to have an opportunity or, or a, a funnel to be able to get that information out to where it can be vetted and it can be checked upon and then be forwarded to the police for a response. And you can see across the country, those situations are, are coming constantly where we're, we're looking at that information at the early on stages before it's actually coming to the point of hurting anyone. An event is being prevented time and time again. And it's now become the, the few and far between it's actually event is happening. But without those abilities for these children to get that information out, almost blindly, it's almost volunteered without recourse is what's preventing a lot of these things from really, you know, going off the charts as far as an occurrence. Mm -hmm. So we found that that's been one of the effective things that's been going on, is having that in place with the peers and at the local level where, where kids can have that uh, ability to share information. They're your best, they're your best sources of information. <coughs> Chief LaRose, do you want to join us up here? <laughs> Be a good question, I guess, you know, the front door, obviously that's what um, Mr. Puglio brought to us last month, but and that seems the obvious first choice. You walk, you walk through the front door. If you were to look at a second thing, what would it be? Would it be cameras? Um, you know, what, what's the second most, you know? Cameras are one of those things that also, it's only as good as the person watching Watching it, it right. Okay. And to have an employee sit there and just have to focus on the camera, it's, it's a really tough thing to sell. I mean, it's great if you happen to walk by it and see it something go across the camera um, also a very expensive option you know I'm sure mm -hmm. you can talk about it as well as all of our businesses that we've served you know just with the state police I was a local police officer before and to have a, a company going by a really good quality video surveillance system for a store a convenience store will run ten fifteen thousand dollars and you're talking about a school down just one school and if you think about adding video cameras and monitors and quality stuff that you're actually going to be able to use and see people, identify people, that was for a small store. This is a mall in comparison. So I have a question about that. Are our um, surveillance cameras able to be accessed by the local police in, in an emergency situation? Well, at the schools, yes, but not remotely. Not remotely. 
<laughs> because I was reading about it and it said if you had that, then they could incident math. I was reading, <laughs> I was doing my homework and, and sort of see where something might be happening and, and react. If I could follow up on what the sergeant started to, to, to explain. For our community, the police chief's gonna tell you we should lock the doors. Uh, most active shooter uh, incidents are over in a very short period of time. Just a very few minutes. We're fortunate here to have a police department with the numbers and the locale to respond to a threat within a short period of time. So with the locked doors in place, they may slow the threat down, throw the shooter down in just enough time to just to give the police department just another half a minute to get here to stop the threat. So it's quite a, um, I would recommend locking the doors. Uh, for those folks who were at the, uh, the statewide governor's conference a couple of, uh, couple of weeks ago, there was a breakout session and, and I was listening to stories of situations that happened, let's say out in I think it was the Northeast Kingdom or the far side of the state where police response was Lengthy, 30, 30, 45 minutes. Uh, lengthy. Um, so I want to just want to encourage folks to uh, take advantage of the opportunities that, and the, and the resources that we have here, to do what we can do to protect our, our, our students and staff. And that is the large variation that the chief's talking about. Having the chief and his folks sp spun up on this and know the building, response time is probably you know in the minutes, in the single minutes, probably less than 10 minutes it, realistically. Whereas the, the city we were talking about at the governor's conference was Cambridge, Vermont. And the response is covering by the state police could be anywhere, if a trooper happens to be coming through town, it could be minutes, or it could be 30 to 45 minutes. So preparing for that window in which basically you are your own entity until that police response, they're having to plan for you know 30 minute window of being stuck in this building with someone coming through causing harm to someone whereas at least here your window was much smaller like the chief said your locked doors are going to prevent people it's smaller I mean a lot can still happen in three minutes absolutely and, absolutely. absolutely and if you can slow it down by a locked mm -hmm. door it's worth it's waiting gold mm -hmm. you know, and it's the average response the average uh, active shooter is about 13 minutes nationally start to finish wow that's that's I minute mean, it's going to seem like a lot of time mm -hmm. right um, that's not very long Grant. I, I'm sorry to interrupt. Just a quick question. You have a lot of statistics on you know, the average, how long it takes for an average shooter beginning to end, all that kind of good stuff. Can you tell me, is it, what, what percentage of the time is an active shooter in a school someone who comes in off the street? I wouldn't have the exact percentage, but I can tell you it's been, in things I've looked at over the years, has been very small. It's been a stranger at all, very small. Sergeant Lamoff, in recent, and you went to the training recently, was there a percentage ever given? No, but uh, Steve said very, very little. Most of the time it is a parent or a family member. It's very rare for somebody to come in. Like the Winooski thing a few weeks ago, I thought that was, that's, un, that's unheard of. It's very, very rare. So um, some of the stats, because I was the last one to go to this training in Rhode Island, and uh, the, the minutes actually went down from 13. It's under 10, so Chief LaRose can get his guys here, and as well as Burlington, other guys from Burlington area quickly, but some of the other towns is a little different. So you guys need to train for your area. You can join us up here too if you'd like. <laughs> I just What's that? I said you could join us up here too if you'd like. I just forgot who was out uh, there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> right, so, so if I understand him correctly, and it's someone that you know that's either a parent or a student, and you have cameras and you're buzzing people in, you're going to buzz the people in you know. In the same response, yes, but if there has been information sharing prior to that, you know, the student has been suspended and suddenly he's at the front desk, at the front window, looking to get in on a day he shouldn't be at school because he's suspended, because he's had problems or she's had problems. You know, it's that communication aspect where if there's something boiling on the stove, it's being able to catch it before it boils over. So hopefully if that buzzer is being used, yes, it, it, the blind, non-expected one is a what if that could happen where you buzz that child through. It hasn't had any issues. There's been no concern academically. There's been no outcry. 
by other students of having issues um, and the students trying to come in on a normal school day the students gonna come in because there's been no issue there's been no flag mm -hmm. per se but if the flag is present and that's been communicated through staff at the school or staff at the building whether it's a school or not and that same person shows and then obviously there's a red flag shows up and that person shows up and that's when those locked doors again call to the police it gives the chief and his folks time to get here that's that window of opportunity to be able to deal with situation out in a parking lot with the chief's folks responding versus letting that same person who had issues come in and dealing with it within the building. This might be a question for Paul, but um, gathering information, like let's say we have a student at the high school who's in tent and you know they're a problem and they have a sibling in another school. What's the, what are our boundaries legally with staff at the high school informing staff at all the schools I mean what's the odds of the schools in this district between we'll have the rec department we have kids there we'll have kids at Park Street now we have Summit, Fleming, ADL, Hiawatha so we're talking seven schools because if we talk about schools we got to talk about rec department here we have to talk about Park Street now so what are the odds that you can get that information out fast enough and are we legally allowed to do that to share info like that with Brad at the rec department with um, all all staff that used to be confidential information I thought well, I'm not, uh, I can't really give you legal advice but I can point you in the right direction to get it um, there's a firm in Burlington that that dress up a lot of information uh, on a national level with yeah, yeah. Uh, Jeff uh, Nolan yeah. Yeah. is a good contact and uh, I can give you some other contacts too but what I want to get to is if it's an issue of public safety information sharing is, is very wide open is it for do I have that right yes it's, yeah. um, that is very much uh, set aside when it comes to safety concerns just like HIPAA mm -hmm. set that aside share the information in in the interest of public safety and that's a big question to, to get through with your folks because without that comfort or being sent down from the top to everyone is they have those things on their mind saying that I can't say that because I'm violating this somehow it, it it's having that knowledge put out there to your folks to have that freedom to understand that a safety issue is, is an exception, exception yeah. clear exception um, to get the information shared. And whether you have a point of contact in each school, again, that's for you folks to decide with how that works best to share information. But I, I know in my schools, I'm from Southern Vermont, and I know there's probably at least one person in each school, a secretary that knows everybody and knows everything. And if I ever want to know anything, I call that one person and I can get anything I want in that school. Every school usually has one or two people that fills that role really well, and it's usually a great contact um, to get that information too to put it out. Do you, in your, when you're talking with people, are there a lot of schools in Vermont that have security officers within the school that are carrying, you know, that are armed? The only security off and they're full-time police officers, um, uh, school resource officers full-time police officers carrying weapons in the school. Those are the only ones I've ever seen. I've never seen anyone, and maybe the chief's heard of something else or through uh, the chief's meetings, but there aren't any agencies that I know that have hired, or towns that have hired outside security to provide security in their schools in Vermont anyways. I haven't heard any of that. Okay, so if they have police personnel that are armed and carrying, are th are the school districts paying for that personnel? I believe a lot of it, it was at one point is grants, and the chief might be able to speak about that more than I can, but it, it's again, it's a community response and a community need, whether they want to fill that or to have that position assigned in the schools, and every community is different. Um, I know a lot of those programs have come and gone. Some of them have stayed and remained. Some of them have passed on and basically gone off into the sunset. I know there are some schools that still have those. Yeah, there is a variance on, on, on funding from, from grant funding to uh, municipal or city funding, town funding, to uh, school funding. It's, it's I think it'll, it'll, it'll vary throughout the state. Mm -hmm. 
One thing I wanted us to consider, especially before budgets, is, is we have the one school resource officer at the high school, and I'd like to know what you think of it, if that's enough for all of our schools, or if, if maybe our four K through eight schools should have their own who was seen daily, because I know the high school kids know um, Bill Laware, but I, I don't know how often he gets to, he's visible in the rest of our schools. So you asked me if you should have another Bill Laware, or? Do you think that, that that's sufficient, one person, do you? Maybe um, that's a difficult one for Miles. What are your expectations of the officer? I mean, you know, are you expecting them to you know stop everything or be there? For your well, let's yeah, just back up a sec. No, Bill Aware is is a former police officer. He's right. a, a security. He's n not armed, as far as I know. Right. Uh, right. I think he is. <laughs> uh, a little different capacity than than say a Kurt McGlennis who's here tonight. If we need to talk to Kurt, yeah. uh, Corporal McGlennis came with me. And uh, Officer Moranowitz, who's uh, throughout all the schools over the course of the year. But anyway, uh, we had a question. Comment? No. I think Kurt could speak to how yeah, frequently Kurt. he's yeah. in schools. You want me to come up? Yeah, yeah sure. Please. Oh, okay. Let's see here. <coughs> Yeah, everybody come up. <laughs> but really, <laughs> okay. I, I I was talking to the sergeant back there. So, was there a specific question to me? Yes. How frequently are are you in in the schools in this village? Yeah, there's only two of us, um, and right now Diana Moranowitz is is assigned mostly to Essex Middle School because she's teaching there. Mm -hmm. I'm on light duty right now because I broke my ankle, um, but when I am around. I, I do try to get to the high school. Uh, I, I, I try to come here um, and whatever school lasts, but we can't stay in one place for too long mm -hmm. because if a school is asking me to be at a certain place at a certain time, I gotta go to that school. Somebody may call me to another school because they got a problem there. I'll go to that school. So I answered the school's issues and problems um, as well as try to be around. Mm -hmm. and, so, and so it, it is with Diana as well. Uh, but there's only two of us, and there's like nine or ten schools here, so, mm -hmm. you know, between the town and the village. And that's funded through EPD, you assign yes. two officers. Yes. And, and you know, it's, it, it, you can stay busy. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Bill Aware also has cameras that he um, can see what's happening um, certainly throughout the Ed Center. And he can also see the um, PC schools as well. So he it's monitors. Web -based. It's web-based, so anybody with a username and password, I mean, I, I can log in and, and see what's going on at all the schools. So we do have that. So you do have that remote. That remote uh, web-based monitoring and spends a considerable amount of time um, doing that and our principals uh, have that information accessible too. Um, some I see have that right on their lap, uh, laptops right on their desks and our, um, our administrative assistants upon entry. So we are well equipped through um, cameras and somebody who actually is looking uh, at that information. Now might be, uh, if, if you're open to it, maybe Lyle. Um, Visbit came a couple, a week and a half ago maybe? Yeah, it was and, November 22nd. looked at the schools yeah. uh, and submitted a report that just came out today that Lyle probably passed around. I don't know if you point to Lyle, just uh, briefly. Yeah, I'm going to highlight it. I'm not going to read it word for word. Tim actually wrote it. He couldn't be here tonight. Um, but I was on the tour with Bruce and Grant. So, um, one of the first things we noticed in uh, was that the relationship between the police department and the administration is excellent and like you say 45 minute response time in one of these outlying schools is very typical of what we find and that's on a good day with good weather so they're really kind of on their own in some of these rural schools um, the other thing we found that was really impressive was all the information you have online if 
you've got access to your network, you can see floor plans, you can see emergency procedures. All, it's, it's like the, the best we've seen to date and the most well organized, so kudos for that. Um, the bottom line is I am kind of have to echo what law enforcement is saying here is we as, you know, Vermont School Board Insurance Trust, we, we believe that uh, entrance and access should be controlled. Um, how you do that, obviously through personnel, which is more rare because it's more expensive. School resource officers are a uh, big expense. We do see many, many schools uh, with card access. And depending on the size, sometimes you'll see that even the, the seniors will have, because they, they can come and go, have their own cards in a smaller high school. Uh, so there are, it's all over the place. It's what works for you. Um, a couple things were said about doors locking and so on and so forth. The things we see when we go into schools are things like that. And you said you, the door is only as good as the lock. That's true, but it's also only as good as that window that can be smashed in the hand that can reach around and grab the egress side of the handle. So we brought some props. Um, this film we're going to actually give to Grant to give to Bruce <laughs> so he can experiment with that. This is not going to make your window bulletproof. What this will do for you is to keep that glass intact if somebody's trying to breach it and keep that hand from coming through and reaching in. Um, we, we approach schools in, in many different ways. Uh, these windows I might look at and say, oh, it's a lot of glass and it's going to be really easily breached. So I might say either start budgeting for laminated glass or start putting window film on it. I look at these windows and say, well, there's no issue with them opening or mechanical issues there. I might say I'd have some lattice work constructed for that, that structural that you can adhere. And of course, you're not putting bars up because you don't want to start to do the prison look, but you could do it in a way that still kept people from breaching it but looked decent. Uh, things like that. So you have to kind of, each situation is a little different. Um, let's see. Again, the access control, that secretary that knows everybody that's coming through the door, yeah, our hope is that she also knows the behavior of that person coming through the door and knows when it's odd and could make a judgment about whether or not it was time to buzz that person in. One thing we do find is if the person at the buzzer is not diligent, it's useless. If it's just somebody walking up the door, and it happens to me all the time, they see me, I don't look like a bad guy, they buzz me in, they don't know who I am. So you really have to train staff, but you also have to train students. I, I walk into schools a lot too, and because I'm there for a security audit, I will try to wander around the school. And usually it's some nice little kid will open up a door and ask me if I want to come in, which is, is pretty typical. And that's a culture thing that's, uh, you know, let's train the kids as well as the staff. Um, the next page is all about glass again, which we kind of covered here with the laminate the 3M window film or some lattice work and uh, that's really just dependent on what kind of window situation you've got. Um, again, badge systems. Um, we find that badge systems, we think that you should probably have a two-tiered badge system. One of them would probably be a green badge so that everybody would recognize that that person's known to the school and it's okay that they're wandering around by themselves and they, they're not a danger. A different color badge might indicate that if they're off by themselves, they probably should have an escort. The other thing is we recommend you have a date on that badge because if they walk out with a visitor's badge, it's good forever. That's not good, and we see that a lot. Um, let's see what else on here. Again, the, the, these windows right by the doorknobs, have got, they've got to be addressed. You can't be allowed to put a hand through that after you smash the glass or the push button locks are of no use. Um, and lastly, we weren't here, we just want to mention that we did see a plan for a playground, a natural playground at one of the schools, and we would love to chime in on that if you need some help trying to figure out how to make that fit in with playground safety rules that do exist because they're a little tricky to fit into a box um, because there's no standards written for those, but that was one thing Tim did want to mention because he's a risk manager. Mm -hmm. Uh, if there are any questions, I went over this pretty quickly, but it's essentially we agree with law enforcement. Mm -hmm. But we understand you don't want to make your school into a prison also. Mm -hmm. Question for you. Um, under supplemental safety item, mm -hmm. what's this about the natural playground? 
that was um, what I was mentioning that one of the schools is looking to Senate possibly Street. build and I'm not sure which one it was yeah. and what we find is it's hard when you're constructing a playground out of natural materials to make it fit into the, the playground safety handbook which keeps certain pieces of equipment certain distances away so you don't fall from one to the next and the surfacing material so that you fall to the ground is things like that there's not a lot of standards there so okay Does um, the film, does the film stop a bullet? No. It will keep the window intact it instead it of it crumbling tight. into lots of little pieces and becoming a doorway. Um, it will keep it more like a car windshield. Um, the, the best way to get that effect is to do laminated glass, which has a piece of film like that sandwiched between two pieces of glass. This is the next best thing, but it's an after-the-fact application. Does it darken classrooms? Well, that's another thing you can do is you can get it tinted so that you can see out, but the bad guy can't see in, which is a nice feature, and sometimes for solar gain purposes and things like that. And it's not m any more money. It's just, you know, what do you want? Um, there's another product out there that we just learned of. These roller shades here, there's a company, uh, Gordon's, that just invented, we found out at the show, uh, the Governor's Safety Conference, a remote control triggers a solenoid and every one of these blinds would drop down in the event of a lockdown which we thought was pretty handy in a, in a big room like this where you really want to be able to obstruct view if you have no great good place to you know shelter mm -hmm. so there are some things that you can do to slow things down in the event of an intruder one thing I like to say is if you can control the, the doors in the hallways when the magnets release without the fire alarm going off if you leave them in the locked position, you've created a barrier one way. One means of, of transport is, is gone because that door in the hall is locked. You can always egress from the, the egress crash bar side, but once the doors release and shut, if you leave them in the locked position, that person's going to have a tougher time getting from you know, room to room or through the school. So things like that you can be thinking of. And we have that in some places, like in yeah. Fleming, and we just put in for a small grant here at ADL for the fire door to automatically close yep. when the remote lock is pushed. Is there more than one manufacturer for the film? Oh, yes. I'm sure I there is. I saw um, a video on how well that works at the governor's conference. Yep. If you check the video out, you'll be convinced that it, it, it buys you time. That's what every law enforcement officer I've talked to said. Right. It gives us a few more minutes to get there it without them. A sledgehammer to a, a yeah, window. A sliding glass door. And it, it will not cave in. You can just keep repeatedly smash it with a sledgehammer. Mm -hmm. So okay. bullets will penetrate right. through. But, but it will stay in one piece. Right. So what this yeah. essence could do for, for us is prevent exactly. what happened in Sandy Hook where the bad actor shot his way. Yeah. Carved out of in those room locks room. in the door were great, but the window beside it was just huge. So. And we sent a team to the governor's conference. Paul O'Brien, Principal Ryan attended as well. Um, Bob Travers, um, Ben Dickey, yes. and, and Vince Ganillo, our IT director. So uh, we take advantage of all of those training opportunities. We. Um, Chief schedules a monthly safety um, committee meeting, and those minutes are shared. Um, Chief recently attended our uh, leadership team meeting at uh, Park Street, and we we had this conversation tonight. We have uh, Principal Use and Principal Ryan and Principal Singer. I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm sure. Okay. I do. Oh, there he is. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, all four of our principals are here as well. Uh, if there's any questions or comments for them. Well, I mean, if you, I don't want to put you on the spot, but if anyone would like to give us sure. your thoughts on that, we're certainly listening. Principals? Anyone <laughs> meaning the principals or anybody? Principals right now. Oh, well, we'll get to Can they hear you? No. No thoughts? I mean, we, we've always thought of the, uh, you know, we try to think of the schools as the principal's buildings and, and you know, they are there every day and, and certainly their opinion is valued and, on how 
that goes. And if you're not comfortable speaking up now, you could shoot an email as well. And we can talk about it. Well, we're always comfortable. Yeah. <laughs> always what? Okay. First of all, thank you so much for talking about this because safety is the first word out of all of our mouths on a daily basis. And so knowing that so many people have come out with that <coughs> as a priority is very heartening. Warm to my heart. I, I know that we as principals will do everything and anything to ensure our children's safety. And there are pros and cons to putting a buzzer on the door. And, and those all have to be weighed by our community. Mm -hmm. Because right now we strive to have a welcoming school, you know, a school where our children know they can come in. There's one door that's always open for them. If after school, for some reason, their mom or dad didn't show up, I always tell them, you always can come in the front door. And certainly there would be someone there to buzz them in, but that whole sense of, of openness to our schools and our community, I think has to be weighed. And yet I can appreciate that some people would feel safer, and yet I know that it could provide a false feeling of safety when we know so often the person is a known person. And there's so many different factors to think about because if a parent is at the door, and there's two other people, how do you let the parent in who has to get to the dentist or whatever when you have to wait to screen the others? You know, there, there would be a lot of training required, but um, if this community, in my opinion, felt that would help them to feel more secure, then we would make it work. Dan, Mary, and I met today, actually, to talk about a number of things, including school safety, and I would echo uh, Mary's words in that we work incredibly hard at the schoolhouse level to ensure that all of our children are safe and, and certainly our staff as well and our visitors. In, in addition to, I think, sensible, practical things that we can do in the short term, I, I think it's really also important, we talked about this this morning, that we take a long-term approach to the issue. I don't think we're going to solve any, any of these issues overnight. And I think out of, we're hopeful that out of this community conversation, uh, we have some long-term pieces that we can work on um, and really become acculturated with, within our greater learning community across all of our schoolhouses. Uh, there's, I think as the officers were all indicating, there's no easy fix and there's no um, uh, panacea for uh, managing a, a horrible issue that has become all too common in our society. Um, but I think we certainly will absolutely avail ourselves to do what's right for the kids. The other piece to this, I think that it's important to consider as part of a long-term um, solution, or at least addressing the issue at the community level, is, is I think really having a very engaging, ongoing conversation about mm -hmm. mental health in our community. And uh, yes, we want to address the windows and the doors and the locks. We certainly do that in the short term if it works. But I think long term, um, we really need to have a, a serious, engaging dialogue about um, mental health and about how mm -hmm. it's affecting all of us. And you know, I think a lot of us were at the meeting that unfolded this past spring uh, in the aftermath of the Connecticut tragedy uh, about a year ago. And um, I think we all recognize how important it is, again, to address that in a very planful and purposeful way. Yeah, I specifically had that uh, improve the school response or, or make sure we maintain a high level of school response to mental health. So I think that's a, a ne complete necessity. Um, and before I, I believe, Frank, you want to say something? or anyone else who might want to have some questions or have something to say. I will say that when we were putting a camera in front of, in front of EJRP, we had, I was surprised at the response from some of our community members. I think you, you'll find, I do think it's necessary to put it out there to the whole community mm -hmm. and get their thoughts because 
um, as Kurt will say, there was a strong response against even having just one camera at the front of the park. <laughs> even on the recommendation of the police saying, yes, we need to have that. So, um, so I personally think it's definitely a community decision. Um, I'd love to hear from anyone who came here to talk to it or, or have a question for our visitors. Um, feel free to, to stand up, introduce yourself, and um, give it to us. <laughs> Can I ask Brad a question? Yep. I have a question for you, Brad. I haven't attended any of the Heart and Soul meetings. Um, has that been a discussion? Because that's what the community is doing now through Heart and Soul is gathering info. So has that occurred in any of the forums about safety, security? Yeah, safety emerges one of the top six values for the community. Um, and there's some good info on the heart and soul of essex.org website um, a one pager about safety but it really doesn't get into the specifics about you know individual decisions like this um, as to whether or not you install locks on doors or cameras in certain places mm -hmm. would the heart and soul be a place to go to get the pulse of the community i think it'd be a good resource for figuring out how to best do that mm -hmm. um, it's, um, that group has had a lot of success in engaging people in, in good dialogue and conversation and has some strong facilitation skills. So I think it'd be a good resource for that. Okay. So I have a question. Um, I'm John Cantero, I live in Essex Junction in the Boy and Girl, and uh, uh, just was wondering, what, if this you know, were to take place, how, how does it have to go down? I mean, in terms of, does it have to be like a vote at, at, in the spring um, springtime or something? I mean, how would it go down if it went down, or is it just from a procedural point? I mean, how does something like this get done? Is it, is it a vote, like in the spring, like during one of those meetings, or is it a ballot thing, or is it, how does that work? Great, you want to? Do you want to speak to that, or I mean, I you know, the the board can make a motion to to you know to lock the doors in the school. I don't know how ready we are for something like that. Um, we can budget plexiglass when it comes time for budgets or whatever that is. Um, uh, we could put it to a vote if we think that. You know, I know in Montpelier I was reading, they had $70,000 worth of upgrades and the community voted on a bond for that. I mean, I think there's different yes. ways it can go, which makes it more confusing. But so it doesn't require, like, a community vote, I guess, a vote. No. no. Essentially, no. No. Mm -mm. It can be done kind of within the committee. Somehow it's decided that this makes sense. It can be a rational thing to do, so yep. we're proceed, and, and then maybe there's monies attached that have to be found. Yep. Like that. Correct. Yeah, correct. And that's where you have your vote. If, yeah. if the money yes. is you know, large and you don't like it, budget time is when you have your chance to, to weigh in on that. Right. right. And we begin our budgets in January, mm -hmm. so you know anything we're not ready for now would have to be from would have to go into those budgets, and and then obviously the community votes on the budget. So. Or we could do a separate article. Or you could do a separate article. Right. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Do you want to weigh in, Ellen? Yeah, um, I'm Sarah Stultz, and I'm sorry I wasn't able to be here for the first part of the um, presentation to really get a good idea of what um, you all recommended. Um, so, but I do, can I ask uh, Mr. Bichansky a question? Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, Ms. Bichansky, I was wondering, you were talking about the mental health issue, which I think is really the long-term problem. Um, I was wondering, did you guys talk about what that may look like? Should the community put resources into addressing mental health? I, I think that's really a question that needs to, that really needs to be received and, and discussed at, at the greater community level. 
and again, I think Sam, you were at the, the mm -hmm. spring meeting um, yeah. that took place up at the Essex High School uh, dining hall. And I, I, that's a question that really needs to be fielded by a lot of community organizations, certainly Howard Center in Chittenden County, uh, mm -hmm. which is our mental health agency in Chittenden County, really needs to be involved with that. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't want to get off on a tangential conversation, but mm -hmm. um, mental health is an issue that we, we really sh struggle with, I think, mightily on a daily basis in our schoolhouses, and it's an issue that we manage with children, students, and, and, and their respective families. And, mm -hmm. and again, it, it's not the answer. Mm -hmm. it, I think it's part of a complement of strategies that we really need to implement long term. And you know, those are things that may also find themselves in, in, in a budget vote. Mm -hmm. um, resources mm -hmm. to, to address those pieces. That's what I'm kind of, I'm kind of, I'm kind of wondering, you know, what, what is the cost of putting something in at the schools to delay that intruder to give the police more time and at the same time afford whatever kind of ideas the community can, community can come up with to perhaps you know um, hire some some special certain educators certain social workers that can be you know I'm just throwing out this thought I mean I don't know if, you know what the answer is but say for example at each school we have a safety person where that person is the go-to for any anonymous calls from students, any anonymous calls from parents, any concern in the community where they can, you know, look into that and be sort of, you know, I don't know what the liability issue, for, I mean, there's, that's just, you know, I don't know. I'm throwing something out here, you know. But in terms of, like, I think that discussion needs to happen because I think we need to weigh, well, what are, what are the expenses for something like that? Should we be putting our some funding into that? Should we be putting some funding into you know these ideas that you have for the school but if the intruder can just shoot out the lock or shoot out whatever still mm -hmm. gonna get in is that you know is that money not being spent wisely um, so that's just what I wanted to bring up uh, my name is Stephen Arnois I have uh, three children in the school district many of you know me I'm also a firefighter and EMT here at Essex Junction uh, I'm not representing the fire department or the rescue squad tonight. I'm only talking to myself. Um, I would really like to see the school walks walked. It seems like a uh, something that's fairly easy to do, relatively low cost. Um, I've spent many years in the safety arena. Uh, noted a couple of safety issues tonight here. Um, in case nobody said it, the main fire exit is out that way. This is the secondary one. Be careful with the chair and the extension cord. Um, this shouldn't be in the way. But I, I think if we really stop and simplify this just a little bit, I've been in Essex Junction for over 40 years. I know I don't look that old, but I have been. And in 1975, when I was at the big red brick building over at Hiawatha School, Mr. Bochansky, and Mr. Hyman is the principal. I went to kindergarten in a trailer out back. And every once in a while, I got to go get the milk and walk by the teacher's lounge where there was cigarette smoke billowing out of it. But we learned something in that time frame. We don't smoke in schools anymore, right? Pretty simple, but they did then. Time went by, I went to Albert D. Lawton School here. Uh, my friend and classmate is uh, on, a, on a bench up front. We learned something about safety in this community that day. A few of you were around, but I feel one of them. We learned something about safety that day. A lock in the front door of the school would not help that by any means. Several years ago, we had an incident in our neighboring the town of Essex, which we all remember, uh, a locked door might have helped that. We speak about mental health. Um, losing somebody that you either go to school with or that was going to be your teacher, I can actually speak on both of them. I was going to school with Melissa. 
my cousin, son, went to Essex Elementary School, and he went um, several years ago to see his teacher before school started. She asked him to draw a picture of her. He went home to draw a picture of her, and he couldn't take it back to her because she was uh, not with us anymore. So that has stuck with two people in, in my family, myself being one of them, for their entire life. Um, the mental health of the community has changed because of that. If you go further ahead in time, we, I mean, we, we've learned all kinds of things over the years. We changed the drinking age back in 19, somebody correct me if I'm wrong, 86, 87. I missed it by like 10 months. Um, because we figured out, finally, that 18 year olds were still in high school. They were buying alcohol for people that were still in high school. And they're all getting together and drinking and getting in their cars and driving and crashing and dying. At the end of the day, this is really about thinking about what we've learned, learning how to slow down. If somebody is intent on doing something, they're going to do it. But if we can slow them down, give Brad and his folks time to work, you know, give you other resources like your firefighters and your EMS people time to get here, to rescue those that are injured, you know, that's worth every penny to me. Every penny all day long. So uh, I would just encourage the board to do that and uh, move forward from there. And if you don't mind, I'm going to have to cut out because i got to go to the fire department. Thank you for coming. <laughs> Did you have, well, Jeff, okay, go ahead. <clears throat> My name is Lisa Hines and I have a son, um, Thomas Fleming. Um, I can speak to doors being locked because I work at the neonatal unit at the hospital. We locked our doors, unfortunately, too late, but luckily not based on anything that could have been worse but wasn't. And as far as how this is going to make children or families feel, I can't tell you how many families thank us because they know their babies are safe. They don't look at it as an inconvenience. They don't look at it as something negative. They look at it as a positive. And what we have to understand, too, is our children are very aware of the world they live in. You tell them to put their helmet on to go ride their bike, doesn't make them afraid to ride their bike. It makes them feel safer. If we tell our children we've got doors locked or we're doing everything we can, they're going to focus better in school. They're going to feel safer. Because any money we're spending on anything else if our children are not safe is not going to matter. And as far as the mental health issue goes, it's a huge issue. As a nurse, I can tell you, I've seen the population of parents that have come into my unit change drastically. And their children are going to be in the school system someday. And this is a very long-term situation. And yes, absolutely, we should try to change the things that are wrong. But in the meantime, we have to be realistic about what is wrong if we're going to protect our children. That does not mean anybody likes it. It does not mean nobody's going to try to change it. This just means in the meantime, we as parents have a responsibility as teachers and everybody, and I think we have a responsibility to the teachers who are teaching our children as well, to keep them safe, to take situations like what happened last year in Connecticut and say, okay, you know, I've heard this coming from New York for as long as I can tell you, this is Vermont, things don't happen here. They do eventually, maybe not as quickly as they do other places, but shouldn't that be an advantage to us? Shouldn't we look at that and say, thank you, somebody gave us a red flag? because we are part, we're not a separate entity. But anything can happen here, and we've all seen it happen. But I think that we really need to think of not inconvenience of parents, because if I have to pick my child up to take them to a meeting or a doctor's appointment, and I know I might have to wait in the line, then I, as the adult, I'll leave a few minutes earlier. I don't think that's a good reason not to lock a door. Um, we, as adults, are going to have to change the way we live, too. But the bottom line is going to be we have to make sure our children are safe. And it's our job to do that. Thank you. Did you have something? This is pretty much a follow up to Sarah Michelle started mm -hmm. to, to get into and Tom mm -hmm. about the mental health and, and the red flags, I think, is what yeah. you're really getting to. Yeah, exactly. It's 
pretty clear from what statistics have told us that a very high percentage of, uh, of assailants shared their information, some information with either staff or students. To put it another way, staff or students knew the vast majority of the time that there was a threat and nothing was said. So that's a systematic problem that, that we are dealing with here in, in our district. And very recently, um, as recent as last week, we talked about taking our threat assessment approach or threat assessment teams to, to another level to address some of these these problems that have failed elsewhere just to let you know we're working on that oh that's okay. great thank you sure. and i think the freedom to report is definitely something that mm -hmm. doesn't cost any money and and we absolutely have to make sure that parents and students mm -hmm. feel safe to report those sort of things um grant you had asked me a question about oh, sorry. Um, how we would go about doing this. I, I guess from my perspective, you know, I would buy these locks if the board told me to buy the locks. Mm -hmm. And typically the way it would work is during budget development, there would be guidance <coughs> to add locks to the budget and then we would put them in place. So I guess that would be my answer is I, I would wait for a guidance from you to, to put them in there and if I get it, then I would. Um, I, I would just say that I get a little nervous about budget approvals and controversial topics during budget approvals are, are <laughs> not necessarily a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, one way to maybe avoid some of that controversy that, that might cause problems with or complications with budget votes and a way to maybe get some feeling for the community feedback on this might be for that to be a separate article. So that it doesn't cause people to vote no or yes on the main school budget, yep. but then we would get some feedback on how people feel mm -hmm. as a second article, and not throwing a bunch of extra stuff in there. I mean, just things like, you know, some 3M film for windows, yep. and, and you know, maybe it's a couple thousand dollars at each school for switching our remote lock to remote lock and buzz in. Um, I'm not sure what the dollar amount is, but it's probably a couple, maybe at the most three grand per building, I would say. Um, so that would be an approach the board could take is let's, you know, get a, a, a realistic F, um, estimate on just the door lock piece and some window pieces and put that out there and just make sure that way you can say that, you know, it's a community decision that they voted for that issue and, and we did get it and put it in place. I completely um, agree. There are other schools, obviously, that have been this through this before you and that you could probably just call them and find out how it's working for them mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. what the real ramifications of having that extra workload is. Mm -hmm. Because when she's not at her desk or he's not at his desk, somebody's got to be there and have that same training. So there's some work involved. Mm -hmm. And I would also say that, I mean, some people may not know that we have social workers in schools. We have a lot of, you know, we have child protection teams, we, we have a lot going on in our schools now to try to help address, you know, mental health issues and, and such. And I think that is, I mean, I hate to say it, but I think that's way more important than putting in a buzz-in system because, you know, the issue in Connecticut, that happened in spite of a buzz-in system. Mm -hmm. um, so that's not going to stop things. Um, it's not going to hurt, you know, to have a, a buzz-in system. I just want to make sure everybody knows that the majority of issues, whenever there's a shooting in a school, it's not a random person who decides to come into the school, although Connecticut, could be argued that was done. But in most cases, it's a high school student, or it's a family member, or it's a staff member, or it's someone who's related to somebody like that that might, might get in even if you have a buzz-in system. So, I'm not saying we shouldn't do it, but I just want to make sure that people have a realistic mindset that that is not going to be, as Tom mentioned, the panacea. It's not going to stop everything mm -hmm. there is to stop. And for clarity, currently we don't have a buzz-in system. No, we have remote, a in remote any of system our so that if there's a threat that somebody knows about, somebody can push a button and remotely lock the doors, uh, or door, because there's only really a main door open. Um, that's the system we have in place. And of course, if somebody's already in your building, that doesn't help, and I understand that. Right. A couple of things you said, said there. 
the only door that sh should be open. I mean, if we do this, as like you pointed out, your policy, your practice is, you know, these security measures are only as good as your policy and practice. So mm -hmm. to go put money in there without training or whatever it takes to implement, you know, make sure these users are used correctly, it's we're creating false sense of security and throwing money at, you know, uh, throwing money away. It's a piece of the puzzle, and I agree. I'm a facilities guy, and if you're having to use the window stuff, it, it's too late, in my opinion. That, that should have been caught with the guidance counselors, and I understand that. But it's a piece of the puzzle, unfortunately. The, the other thing that we talked about this morning with Dan Barry and I met was that, you know, increasingly our schools are more than, are open and accessible more than just eight to three. So uh, at Hiawatha, for example, and at Fleming, we have two before school programs that start at 7 o'clock in the morning. So we have 15 kids in the building plus staff at 7 in the morning. And all of our schools, does someone have an after school program? So all three of our pre-K-5 schools have an after school program. I know at, at Hiawatha, a, a, a quarter of our kids. So we have 60 plus kids who are participating in the after school program. And that runs until 6 p.m. So, um, regardless of what we do, it's not an eight to three um, situation. It really is, at least right now, seven in the morning until six o'clock uh, in the afternoon. So, what's our next step? Well, let's just make sure okay. everybody okay. has um, <coughs> spoken if they'd like to. I, I think of this as a continuous improvement issue, just like other things in our school are focused on continuous improvement. You know, safety is part of our action plan. Um, safety is something we do a audit of every year and file a report. And with that report comes budget recommendations. Um, I think about when I first started at Columbia met Captain Nato as he came to visit the school. He had a conversation with me. He encouraged me to be part of the school public safety committee, which I attended pretty loyally over the years. Mm -hmm. um, so what we learn at the school public safety committee also uh, enhances what we then put into action in our schools. Um, you know, I think about all the things that we've done over the years mm -hmm. to raise that level of, of safety and assuredness that we're doing all we can. Um, I think about how we constantly practice our emergency drills. You know, years ago there was some fear about practicing drills such as lockdown or clear the halls because it would have an undue effect on our students. And why put them through that scary situation when it probably wouldn't be necessary to, to put those procedures in place. We have a different reality today. We're less worried about how those drills are going to scare our students and more concerned about how it's going to keep us all safe by practicing those drills and doing the right thing to keep ourselves safe. And how safety is in our schools is seen as everybody's responsibility. Uh, students, staff, parents, community members, principals, it's, it's all of our responsibility, that's the message. I would hate the message to be if we put locks on the door with a camera monitoring that door, that now safety is the responsibility of the secretary sitting at that desk looking at that camera. Uh, we, I'm concerned about that, if that becomes the reality. Um, but we've upgraded, you know, all around the school, putting film over glass, uh, putting uh, push button locks on every door to every classroom. Uh, you know, we, we have a huge list of things that we've done in, in regards to safety. And we continually look at that, we continually question how can we make the school safer. Uh, is on that list and has been on that list. Should we lock the front door and put a buzzer system? Yes, that's been on that list. But to this point, the answer to that question has been, we're not ready to go there. But that is, as it's been said here very strongly, uh, that it's a community decision. 
things that we've done up till now haven't been <coughs> sort of a, a community response. We haven't put push button locks on doors or done any of the host of things that I just mentioned here um, because the community has come and said do that. So that's a little bit of background and history and to add to what Mary and Tom said and that we constantly focus on. Some of what Dan's talking about is in this brochure right here, okay? I'll just leave those with you. Did you have? Hi, my name is Tom Lyons. I'm from Essex Junction. I have uh, one son. That's Fleming and, and uh, know Dan from previous conversations and, and my son had an awesome experience at summer school and I appreciate all of your efforts. And we can talk about important long-term issues like mental health, um, and we can talk about other factors such as certainly cost, um, employee training, um, and any other issue that you could put as an obstacle to getting in the way of doing the right thing. I know we're not there, we don't want to get there yet, Dan, but what, what event does it take to get there? I don't want to wait till then. So I'm here to press for a buzzing system and bulletproof glass. And I would like that to be considered in the budget process that's coming up. Um, <clears throat> I think we're all aware, I think on December 17th, is the anniversary date for what happened in Newtown. Um, I'm not sure about the time frame that it took for the police to get there. <coughs> what was that? Three, three four under, minutes. Under four minutes. Which means in less than that time, we lost 20 children and six school people, six school employees. I, I appreciate the discussion about what it takes to get into this and everybody's involvement from law enforcement to parents to school administrators and principals. In the end, you array all the possible obstacles that you can come up with against the what if and the knowledge that you don't want to ask yourself what if we had done all these things. We are trying to be proactive here. The film on the windows and everything else that you've done is great, but it is reactive only. It's not gonna stop anybody from getting into the school. Lord knows there's no 100% guarantor of safety for anything. There's no one thing you can do that's gonna prevent every scenario. We're not asking for that. We are not asking for a foolproof method. We're asking to do a simple, implementation of the obvious. Things that you can do now while we research and, and look into mental health and other long-term things that certainly need to be addressed. But don't let that be the thing that you do now instead of the security measures that we're talking about. So I hope that we can consider this and I am all for doing what we can right now. Question, Tom. What are you what are you proposing? Buzzing system. I know. I know we have, uh, you know, the surveillance system. Um, I'd like to find out if there's a way to um, provide monitoring of that with the buzz-in system and bulletproof glass. Um, now, Montpelier, Colchester, uh, South Burlington, Fairfax, St. Albans have done some <coughs> some sort of method of school security. Let's ask them. Let's find out what it takes. I don't have all the answers to that, but I am proposing at least a secure buzz-in system with bulletproof glass. Bulletproof glass in every window in a school? No, no, uh, not in every window in the school. I, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure what is entirely affordable, but at least perhaps uh, uh, a walk-in area, an alcove, where you walk in the front door, you go into Fleming School, there's a 10 by 10 area, it's bulletproof glass, the employees on the other side 
and that's that's where it happens. I'm talking about entry. If if we have other every other door locked but the front door, then we have to worry about the front door. Well, and each each school is going to have to have um, something different. It's going to have to be a different scenario. For absolutely, each. It, it, it absolutely I agree. Modify it to the layout of the school in question. Fine, but do it. I concur, Mr. Hines. Pleasant, pleasant system. Something, something around the doors. I mean, and Mr. Chief LaRose perhaps knows most of the time the assaults happen at the front doors. They go in that way. I don't know what the stats are, but I think that's, I assume they shoot out by the front door and they go in that way. They don't just go around the back and look through the windows and shoot the window out and go in that way. But from what I've seen on TV, it seems like they go around the front door and shoot their way in and go in that way. So. I agree with Mr. Well, something to look at. Look Many at more schools, the front door, right to the left or right of your front door, is the window to a classroom. Yeah. I mean, so we can. I think we're creating a false security there. That's why you, know, you, you know. Is there anybody else who wanted to speak? Gabrielle? Hi, my name is Gabrielle Smith, and I'm the parent of two students here at ABL. Um, I see this issue as actually being pretty complex. And um, I'm in and out of the schools quite a bit because I'm a consultant with the district. And um, I think of I think of my children's safety all the time, of course. And I make choices. My husband and I make choices all the time. Um, I'm not going to list for you all the things about my home that I could probably spend money on to improve to keep my children safer from an intruder in my own home. I chose not to do those things because maybe they're too expensive. I put my child in a motor vehicle every day. Um, and so I, I think of potentially the impact, as some of the principals have noted, on the culture of our schools. But I also listen to what some of the experts have said. And I would like to hear down the road, perhaps encourage the, the, uh, the PC to find out a little more research about the effectiveness of this particular strategy. What are all the wraparound things that need to happen to ensure that it's effective if you were to do it, um, and what those cost would mean for us, both in terms of um, hard, hard money, but also in terms of our staff allocation. Um, so I'm uh, wanting to make sure that we are taking steps that help, help our children feel safe, but everything is, 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 uh, has a balance and has an impact. And so I, I hope that uh, we can, as a community, can take the time to ensure that we understand and are making the choice that we really, uh, have thought through. I hear everybody's passion. We all Great. feel passionate about our children's safety. So that's all I'll say. Thank you. Hi, my name is Frank Toledo. I have two children currently enrolled in the system, and I have two that are currently in college. I said a lot at the last meeting, so I don't want to take everybody's time up, especially the board, reiterating everything I've already said. Um, I think the board and the community has done a lot already to make sure our children are safe. And, and when I understand the reasons why we haven't taken the final step to lock the front door, is the problem. I, that's the biggest problem I have. We're trying to slow them down. I mean, any law enforcement officer is going to tell you that's the goal, is to slow them down. And our current process, just so I don't know if everybody understands it, our current process is all the doors are locked and the front doors are monitored. The receptionists and the people at the schools are monitoring our front doors. So the resource is there, we're monitoring it. We don't want to make that final step and lock the door. Why? Because I, I look at it as part of it possibly is to make the school welcoming. But I also see it as an inconvenience factor for the staff to have to make those split second decisions. But having that mechanism to lock the door if you see a threat works if you see the threat. Our current process does not protect us, does not protect our kids from a non-visible threat. A handgun or something underneath an overcoat, and someone's going to walk right into the schools. And you know, what happened in Newtown, and I read the report, I read the state's attorney's report, and I know they got there within four minutes of that first 911 call. They were on scene. They did the best they could. They got there as fast as they could. Outstanding response time. But that first 911 call, 11 call, came through when he shot through the glass. If he was able to walk right in, 
without a door being locked. He would have created chaos before that 911 call was hit. He got through 156 rounds in less than five minutes. They were there in less than four. One minute after they were in the parking lot, the last shot was heard. So within five minutes, he got through 156 rounds. And when they found him, the last shot, they think it was a self-inflicted wound. The, when they found him, he had 253 live rounds on him. So had that not first call not happened to shoot his way in, the first call would have happened a minute or two later. And maybe instead of 26 children and adults there, there would have been 46 or 56. So, again, I don't want to reiterate everything I've said. Is this is just to slow them down, to give law enforcement a chance to arrive. That's all we're trying to do here. And this current process does not do that, in my opinion. It's left wide open, especially from a non-visible threat. And it's out there. They know what our processes are. Other communities have stopped this. They, they put the buzzing system, and it's not going to stop someone with a, an assault weapon to get through there. But the technology that's out there now, and it actually was tested in Connecticut, is bulletproof, I'm sorry, bullet-resistant glass. And it's installed, they, they tested it. The new stuff out there is 20 to $25 a square foot for the, install, for the glass itself, itself, and it's stopped an AR-15 round. That's a non-visible barrier. Not intrusive. It's still welcoming. People, can, they don't know it's there, but it's there if you need it. So the lock on the door, to me, stops non I think I said this. I don't even know if I said this already. But if someone wants to get in, they're going to get in. You're not going to stop them. You're trying to slow them down. The chief has <coughs> come here and said, "You should lock your doors." So he said it that way, some way, to that shape or form. The door should be locked. You're safer. Police stations have bulletproof glass. The doors are locked. I work <coughs> in a federal building. You can't even get in without going through search. Um, you have to go through the magnetometers. You have to empty all your pockets. You can't take cell phones up to the courts. We protect our banks where our money are. Why won't we lock the door to prevent and delay entry? That's all, I'm, that's, it's, that's all it's going to do is give the chief a chance to get here. And if he gets here 30 seconds earlier, that could be saving lives. Thank you. So before I bring this back to the board for discussion, does everyone, does anyone else have anything? Sam? Um, thank you, because I think that answered some of my questions since I wasn't here for the first half. Mm -hmm. um, I just don't want, I mean, I, agree wholeheartedly with that. Um, I just don't want a decision like that to over, to just stop the discussion. I really want a further mental health discussion to occur because we have things go in the school to support kids. We have things going on at the police level. I think it needs to be <coughs> more, and we have the teen center. We have a lot of great things here in, the, in Essex Junction. I think we need a discussion on what do we have, what holes are there, and how can we get out to the community that this is who you can contact, and this is who you should contact if you have any concern. Let's work together to keep our kids safe. And I think that, with what this gentleman just say, said, might might be a great safety net for our kids. I want to thank everyone for coming. We all have our kids' safety in mind. I, I appreciate you using your evening to, to be here. And, and I know sometimes it's intimidating to speak in front of everyone. So I appreciate everyone who did and everyone who came to um, weigh in on this issue. Um, I'm going to bring it back to the board to discuss um, amongst themselves. I'll hand it off to you, Michael. <laughs> Mr. Chair. Yes. Well, any immediate thoughts? Folks? Another Mom? question for Brad. Uh -huh. um, the public safety brochure that you gave us, um, it sounds like you, that's something you discussed at the last meeting. Sure, what, what 
is the topic is yours or the safety committee for sure Sorry. you mean the committee we discussed at the last meeting so, no no not our committee oh the dis the you gave out a brochure there's a committee that meets what is it once a month that discusses public safety mm -hmm. focused on the schools yes mm -hmm. and it's all it's primarily focused on the schools yes okay I just um, curiosity within this committee is there a possibility of discussion of a direction a suggested direction that we should uh, pursue looking at the professionals I mean this committee is the Essex Police Department it's the town of Essex um, that's the superintendent's uh, department you got the fire departments there you got the rescue justice center you know is that something that committee could take on for discussion for a I don't know how to word it like I look at strategic planning and I there's got to be a strategic planning to look at for safety and security in the schools so that I as a board member know the money I'm going to be looking at for this year's budget and how we can incrementally increase it I'm not sure I as one board member or our board do I feel comfortable putting a dollar amount in this year's budget yet grant is developing it but how quick could a recommendation come through school leadership team and public mm -hmm. safety committee mm -hmm. how well this is what I'll, I'll, I'll recommend to you the committee is there to help we'll do whatever just like the police department you call we're there we'll help you in any way we can but before we present to the school public safety committee I would recommend uh, dissecting what you folks would like to see first uh, like I said way back at the start the police chief is going to tell you to lock the doors but I am well aware it goes much deeper than just locking the doors uh, then uh, Dan mentioned we don't want this the, the burden of security to shift to a secretary okay well what do we have to do to address that issue do we need to train somebody to monitor um, what is the the physical um, requirements the buzzer system what will that be comprised of is it a camera system is it glass bulletproof uh, glass is it a, again a camera um, I guess I'll just shorten this up we'll do whatever you like us to do to help but enable to enable us to give you a, a real educated opinion share with us a little more of what you envision you you would like to see Can I, just because as Marla mentioned in a month we're going to be sitting around the table for the first draft of the budget um, as a just guidance maybe that I'm asking you to give to me uh, how about I get an, an estimate for the buzz-in system which like I said I think going from what we have to a buzz-in system is probably maybe a couple of three grand per building that's not the big expense the big expense would be bullet resistant glass so I could get a vendor to come in and give us an estimate for the buzz-in system and bullet resistant glass surrounding it in the main in, in just the vicinity of the main entrances I mean just to be realistic and I can bring that as part of the budget development but I would recommend that I mean you're very in touch with wanting to make sure the community has a chance to be heard on this so I would say if we do that and come up with an estimate for something like that put it in as a separate article that way you get the feedback of the entire community yes or no if it's yes then it doesn't I mean we'd have the money beginning July 1 and we could uh, hopefully have something in place by the beginning of the school year I don't know that we'd be ready to initiate a buzzing system immediately though I think we could have it in place and then we would have to talk about training or whatever else we need in order to make sure that we're doing it the right way across across all four schools but if you're comfortable with that I can at least get an estimate so that you know we have something to start with budget development and you know we I would say that we would still want to look at putting stuff like this in on interior windows around doorknobs 
maybe around some of the other windows close to the main entrances and you know keep trying to expand this until you know ideally you have this on all your windows but the bullet resistant glass is not cheap and I wouldn't want to say bullet resistant glass in every window because all I would be doing is just ensuring that people would vote no but if it's just around the main entrances then it's not a ridiculous dollar amount that we're talking about and if and if people are supportive of it then, then you'll see I think also um, the chief and um, myself and, and those on the safety committee can talk more about uh, threat assessment, um, as he talked about earlier, and um, do some strategic planning around that, identify some further safety needs. Um, principals have all been encouraged to have EPD available at their drills so that they can give us feedback. Um, and uh, we've just reviewed um, last spring all of our protocols so that we have we share the same protocols with Essex Town the building that um, protocols that we drill um, so the more standardized that is I know the chief has all our floor plans all the information so I think the question at hand is um, do we lock our front doors? And if um, if we were to move in that direction, we would have to have not only the equipment, uh, but the training as well. And the question around that would be, um, when would that be something we could implement? Um, and I don't know that answer because we don't have the equipment or the we can do the training piece that I'm confident on uh, but the equipment isn't going to happen immediately um, I think we could look at the protocol of maybe and I don't know and I shouldn't be brainstorming in an open meeting but I do think about do we lock after um, most of the students have entered if there's a way our cameras can be used and we'd have to explore that to see if we can um, but I just don't know if we have the resources the human resources at the moment to manage that nor the training so I hear you I just want you to know you've been heard and that we certainly have taken your testimony from the last board meeting and brought in a security assessment and chief and state police um, in our earnest efforts to ensure safety of all of our students. Um, last spring after the Connecticut tragedy the board did hear um, what we have in place around mental health services in our school and Aaron McGuire came in and did uh, a presentation to the board on that information. Um, I'll echo what Gabrielle said, it's a complex issue um, and I think the only promise that could be made or guaranteed tonight is that we'll continue to study it and see how we can ready ourselves to, um, to ensure that we are safer. So I would like to see consensus from the board to give Grant that budget guidance of telling us how much each individual item is going to cost and possibly if there is money to get those buzzing systems faster than next year's beginning faster than July 1 I don't know if you magically have money I know you don't magically have money. No. <laughs> but but worth taking a look at even you know if you tell us no um, that I would like to see consensus from the board to at least see see that for our next meeting and that's for um, buzzing and doors locking door and the resistant proof yeah. glass around the entrance. I'd actually like right. to see whatever the say the recommendations from the visit report um, um, those taken into consideration also I haven't had a chance to read it so I don't know if it's anything different than the buzzing and the 
you know. The district report, as Ms. Lyle can say, they, they don't get into the specifics. They, they say access control, but they don't define a specific solution. Because each okay. building is very different. And, okay. they, and they describe window film or, or you know, something along the line of full existence. Okay. They don't discuss about which windows specifically. Okay. So we can hook up with vendors that can give you that sort of advice. Okay. And I'd personally like to see us consider a school resource officer for our four schools because I really think that um, uh, having it bill aware is just, you know, I just feel like if we had someone in our four schools getting to know the kids, getting to know the teachers, you know, assessing those threats on a daily basis, I think that would be, you know, a bonus. Did you? One more. Can I add something? Just real briefly, the And this is more for Chief Arose, and this isn't something that we need to answer tonight, Chief. It's just something you can maybe think about and you assess your resources. Is what I've heard about what other communities are doing across the country is that they're lacking funds for more resource, resource officers because we have about eight or nine schools in Essex. And that's a lot of resource officers. Mm -hmm. and I see the budget for one. The ideally, situation is one each school. But what other communities have done is they've actually had offices inside the school that encouraged officers to come in and do their paperwork, not an assigned school resource officer, but have a, an office dedicated that if an officer is available, he can come in, stroll in, do his paperwork, and then go off and do his patrols. And he can be assigned and get all, charged all calls from the, from the, from the uh, actual school. So he's not assigned to the school. But it's a presence there. The cruiser's out front. He's in and out. They don't. Someone would never know when an officer was there and not there. And the other thing communities have done is actually encouraged officers to park in their parking lots, the school parking lots, when they're not being on calls. So those are just things other communities have done to when they lack the resources for resource officers. Thank you. Do you agree with those guys who play the spot? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, but it's just it's <laughs> deployment of resources. Right. Okay. Yeah. 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 I mean, Essex Town has the lowest, almost the lowest per capita officers in Chittenden County, in the state. So if we want that, we need to go to town meeting and say that's what we want in our budget. But the school resource officer is a school employee, right? Isn't Bill aware? That's school about. employee, right, typically so a retired police a officer, police. doesn't a have a gun. Employee. But yeah, wouldn't it be a liaison with the police? No. No. Our, no. Our, no. Yeah, I think oh, okay. You Whatever. Just have to think about okay. the, the, the terminology. Right. So I'm telling you, are, you, are, you are, are we asking for that? Or are we asking for another police officer to be dedicated to, you know, what are you asking for? And, uh, and what you mentioned That's was more of a bill aware type of person. That's what I would like to see happen because, you know, I think. I, I just feel like our schools are sort of not really part of that. I know it is, and I know he has, he can turn on the monitors and they can too, but I don't think you have that connection with parents and students right. that you might have, you know, Bill might have at the high school. Um, you know, I think as my kids came up through these schools, I had no idea who Bill Aware was until my kids got to the high school. So. And every parent should know who he is, or who. who. That's my opinion. <laughs> Put my parent hat on. Right. So uh, I just want to make sure that, uh, that the board has basically reached consensus that we would like to have uh, Grant um, take a look at, at hardware equipment, uh, physical items as far as the uh, for budget consideration. I but if we consider buzzing solutions I would like to hear from the leadership team at one of our mm -hmm. before we make a final decision I like I would like to hear what their perceptions are <coughs> of what kind of staffing they're going to need because that should be part of the cost and the problem is once we add staffing that has to go in the regular budget you can't put that in a bond vote well, I'm not talking about bond, really. I'm just talking about a separate article. Well, you'd need to bring us something, and I'm assuming it would go in a bond. No, not a bond, a but just a separate article. Separate article, okay. Right. Separate article. 
of you and so once we do that with staffing though they're in the next year's but I mean we consider it's an ongoing expense right because I, I, I consider like I mean the hardware changes you know uh, considerations as well as uh, staffing training policy changes um, all those things are you know honestly that's all part of this you know what we're talking about here and but just just to put it out there when we have the budget considerations everybody here you know that's that's where we talk about you know and make these decisions as we come up with what the budget's going to look like and so we encourage you folks to to come to those and, and continue to give input the, I personally think if we're going to go any direction though we have to include the rec department we have to include Park Street. Yes. And I would be very curious of how Brad would be able to lock down a rec department. You know, we've got children there. We've got children at Park Street. So once we put this policy into place, because we are in charge of the rec program, we've got to have a consistent right. policy among them all. So that's going to be a cost to EJRP. Well, I, I, right, because one of the things I also comes to mind is that with the HEC 62 agreements, does that in some fashion obligate us with the daycare or with the uh, preschool? You know, since we view. provide funding, does that also so is there is there expectation necessitate an, you know a safety obligation? Can we get a breakdown of each school and what the recommendations are for those safety needs at each one? Because if you're locking a door, say at Hiawatha, and you're putting bulletproof glass right there, mm -hmm. you have four or five huge windows with students right, right there. So what is the point of that if they can get through the other glass? Well, so I want to I want to see a breakdown. Right, because each school each is school. configured differently. Completely. Um, well, yeah. what's our grant? I think right now, right, right, right now, our yeah. grant only is for the door. Because right. we're getting all these other scenarios, I don't think we can, Grant can do that right now. So I think it's can just Can we look buzzer. into this? Because it could be blackened on the windows at least. Could we minimal, minimally look at that piece of it and see how much that would cost so that someone couldn't see in of those windows? I just needed to be defined. Right, that's <coughs> what you need to find, so. That's why I was saying right now, if we go with bullet resistant glass, you're just talking about so that I have something to be able to estimate right. for you quickly just in the immediate area around the entryway. You could probably get a general per square foot price for that sort of material and that would be close. Some of the other so basically videos. film and the and the and the locking yeah. system. That's Correct? I'm not sure about the film. I would have to talk I'm gonna I've got a vendor that I can talk to about whether the film or whenever you say bullet resistant, that's different than film. Mm -hmm. The film just stops it from from Shatter. just shattering and falling Correct. through so that you can walk through. Bullet resistant is different. Yeah, but are we just talking bullet resistant on the doorway or are we talking I mean, on all the windows? I think only the film because at this point I think the only thing we're trying to do is slow them down. We're not going to stop bullets because like you're saying all these buildings have classroom exposure right next to them. I think before we start directing any gunfire away from an entrance to a classroom we better think long and hard about this. right? And, uh, mm -hmm. That's what you're doing. You're, you're, you're trying to hold somebody up or redirect them someplace else. And we want to be careful what we do with them. Right? So I, think I, I think somebody who's really intent to get into the schools right, the, the are end. going to know where the security flaws are. So mm -hmm. your comment of redirecting it somewhere else is probably absolutely correct. But now, most, most perpetrators like, like this are. Have they studied it, or is it basically, you know, a pretty rash act, and not a lot of thought went into entry? If I would ask that at a one of my training sessions, <laughs> we'll get. There's no cookie cutter. Okay, so right. right. Yeah. Okay. But it is commonplace for there are a lot of thought, a lot of strategy, mm -hmm. a lot of planning mm -hmm. that go into some of these. Have have gone into some of these attacks. But most of them all gone in the front door too. Right. They right. haven't gone in a side door, a back door, through a right. window. They've gone right through the Only because they weren't stopped. So now if we're taking measures to stop them there, now what are we causing? Now we're we just pushing the problem to a worse place. That's it. You know, right. and, and, right. and I don't really That's answer the that. Right. Like we, should be, we should think right. about that before we go do something. And, uh, we got rid of this. Hopefully it's all we needed. But, uh, mm -hmm. Do you have what you need? 
<laughs> Not yet. Does it sound like that? <laughs> okay. So do we need to, I mean... I think I need to definition of what we're talking about. Yeah. I understand we're talking yeah. about a lockdown system at the front door, bullet uh, glassing around each school's Park Street and the rec department. Park Street and the rec department? Is that what you're telling me? Essentially, yes. So the issue, <laughs> not ripping, not but I'm struggling with defining exactly what it is that we. So that that's we're what I Grant. hear to start with. If mm -hmm. we're right, but it the question is: is it bullet resistant or do we want film? That's it's. But well, yeah. can you price both so we can see the difference of? In your free time. <laughs> I've got sure, a lot of free time coming up, Grant. Go about <laughs> <pricing> <laughs> systems at, at places other than your four K, K schools. I mean, right. Park Street School doesn't have a secretary or administrative assistant there. Right. I mean, I don't know which. Well, after you take advantage of just technology, do we have to have somebody actually sitting at ADL who's buzzing an ADL person? Why can't you have somebody? I'm sure you could get an app on a phone that shows you the cameras of all these places. You could have somebody. Your, your school resource officer driving around, he's got his phone and he's buzzing the person in. Or she, right? Somebody who's trained. You know, I, I, I don't think we have, I, I, I'm really leery of putting this on to four secretaries. You know, I, but they weren't, they were, that's a complete job you know, change. Right. And I, I think we have to be careful there. It's well, I see that as part of the discussion of the training and the staffing and, and responsibilities yeah, and the point. policies. There's no immediacy. Uh, it, it's going to take time mm -hmm. to think it through. But at least start with let's let's see what money we need just for some initial steps. And to realize we maybe our main have the bud the badge system that um, that was recommended. We have that piece in place. We could date, you know, add dates. There's some pieces within that report that we could address um, and refine as mm -hmm. far as what we've been working on. Good so question. Yeah. I know today there's fire drills going on all the time. Is there such a thing as a Intruder drill mm -hmm. or something like that. Some guy's in a gun. Everybody knows what to do. They all run and hide in the closet. What do they do? I don't know. There yes. is a system like that in place. And is it done once a year? Or no, they rotate. Yeah, okay. there's like now? six of each. Is, that what it is? Okay. Is the high school considering this? The high school does the same drills. No, they, they, no, no I mean as far as this, doors. they might have more open doors than the front door. I assume. The high schools have a security staff, and so what they're doing is um, reworking their procedures right now so that they'll have a person actually, their security staff, at their front entrances, both at uh, the high school and at CTE. So that's underway now, that procedure. They're kind of like the hockey the, the building or uh, mm -hmm. the second front entrance that are right there. Is that's not, that's not that's locked. Oh, it is. Okay. Yeah. I see my sign coming out. They're all coming in. Yeah. <laughs> coming out, but not okay. going in. <laughs> so it's just the main entrances that are, like every other school, we have the main entrances. Uh, the high school has the security <coughs> staff that they're reworking those schedules to make sure there's somebody there at all times. <coughs> Checking badges. Sign in at the office, directing that. Quick. Um, just to follow up, <coughs> we, the police department, uh, tries to be present at the drills that mm -hmm. you were asking about, just so the kids see us and get acclimated mm -hmm. to uh, uniforms. Okay. We appreciate all the time <laughs> and the work. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of work. Okay, so one more time, Grant. <laughs> Do you have what you need then, more or less? I am going to, I'm going to price out buzzing systems for all the schools and bullet resistant <coughs> glass around all the main entrances of the schools, if possible. Also, instead, how much it would be for film like this instead of bullet resistant glass. Um, I'll take a look at Park Street School. I mean, that I don't think it might be just a swipe system. card. We have yeah. swipe cards yeah. there, so that's mm -hmm. that's okay. already a swipe <coughs> card thing there. Yeah. And I will take a look at REC. REC would, the only thing about REC is that's a different, a different budget. So yes. we wouldn't have a separate article for that unless you want to end up with a whole bunch of articles. But uh, I'll look at that too. The question, the only other question is: so is it a will of the board for me to price out 
a security person, not a school resource officer who's armed, but a school personnel security person for K-8? A bill aware. A bill yeah. aware type of person? I think so, I mean, and I would yes, we need her. to know what space that individual is going to take <coughs> in one of the schools and where, because the space issues. I would imagine that person wouldn't spend much time just in one place, but um, we would have to look the out. The choices are going to be either ADO or plumbing. <coughs> we'd have to find a spot. Right. Are we going to look at, into any of the film on the windows near the main doors? That, that was the other piece. Just the, the I thought you said on the door. Right. <coughs> yeah, in the windows surrounding the main entrance. Yes. In any, so, I mean, I'm not going to start going, oh, well, this one's kind of close, this one's kind of, that one's close to, but anything that's around the main the entrance classrooms. doors. Okay. You know, like at, at Hiawatha, you know what their entrance looked like. There's right. windows around the doors, too. So I would do the windows around the doors there, too. I'm speaking to the classroom windows that are right next to the door. Yeah. That is a concern because right. you have the same thing ADL and <coughs> right. So that's why I say so to break down from each uh, well, for I mean, each so school. Well, next, the next, 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 next classroom, classroom, the first classroom, the first, classroom, the first three classrooms, the first five classrooms, yeah, you get every classroom in this wing. I mean, there's not a classroom; it's actually now an office. It's, it's also where, where are those I people going to go locked down? Or are they behind a wooden door somewhere where you can't be seen? Do you have blinds that will drop automatically? Are there are all sorts of things you've got to think through. It depends mm -hmm. on the, that particular classroom. Are the windows up high? Are they down low? I mean, there's just a lot. And there's so many options here. And, and we obviously need some sort of, you know, maybe it's part of the <coughs> public school safety committee. We, you know, get a, a mm -hmm. committee there to really put forth a you know, suggestion. Absolutely, yeah. Is it's available to help us with the plan? I mean, the answer they're all going to say, though. Yeah, you should do it. Right. So I mean, I don't know if you need to waste Brad's time to, <laughs> to find out should we put you know this on the windows. I mean, he's going to say, yeah. <laughs> well, I think, say, I think yeah. the committee would say yes, but they would also have a ton of questions. Mm -hmm. I think everyone right. knows that this this is more than just locking doors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I would say for step one, it would be doors and windows in the immediate area of the entrance. And then what we would be talking about doing is expanding using this. I mean, <coughs> as quickly as possible, as quickly as we can. Mm -hmm. And I, I wouldn't want to be posting something out there saying, good news, we've got these right. windows treated now. Right. 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 <laughs> um, but we would just try to expand as much as possible using this type of, of film and uh, seeing if our in-house people can get to a point where they can do a good job putting this on. Mm -hmm. um, we can go from there, but immediately at least. Uh, okay. okay. Yeah, I can do that. Bring it to you next month. Somebody else? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, to, uh, this all sounds really positive and productive to me. Uh, I appreciate it very much. It sounds like uh, Grant is, is going to get all this information for the purpose of making a decision to include this in the February budget. Is that? Do I have that right? The budgets are voted on, on in April. But uh, we do our budget work, yes, yes beginning, January. end of January, January. Okay. So are we to assume as parents that in the February meeting we could have a decision about what it is we're going to do, if, if anything? Do I have that right? What we're going to propose for but anything, but in, in the cost of cost. I, I wouldn't well, say the February meeting, March. March. Or March, um, okay. March, by the March meeting. Um, At least the first steps. Right, the first steps of what the what is going into the budget, what mm -hmm. everyone's agreed to, but we have meetings twice a week in February, usually, mm -hmm. I think, and um, those Hold are, on. I think it's January 20th yeah, is our first January budget 20th intercession. January 20th is the first meeting, yeah. and, oh, okay. and they'll be posted. But January 20th. And so this would be for the possible implementation of whatever for uh, September of 2014? Yes. Okay. Are people yeah. feeling generally in favor as a matter of principle to what we're talking about here? Are you people on the board? I, I think we have consensus to have Grant bring us back numbers. That's all I can promise you right now. Okay, but it sounds like everybody else feels more positive than that. A few people do. That's because it sounds like a separate article. If it's a separate article, then it, can it makes it easier. Mm -hmm. So, can I suggest a twofold then? The uh, deposit system be one piece, and if there's enough funding for that, and then if there's additional funding, they pull up the existing glass. Or is it going to be all, all or nothing? I just want to make sure I'm clear. Here That's on just that. something.
something we have to sort of figure out along the way. It sounds like the buzzer system might be less money, but more logistics, logistics and training and right. that sort of thing. I mean, and then the rest of it might be the money part. So it's. I guess we all know. You know, there's a factor of being able to do what you can with what you have. Right. Everybody has a budget, mm -hmm. and, and, and I, I appreciate that. So I guess. We're hoping with an expectation of doing the most that you can with the first set of dollars and then seeing what's available thereafter. I suspect the new chair could do the agendas for our work budget sessions, worded in such a way so you know specifically the night we discuss the safety issues. We could send out. Yeah. Get other ways as well, so the community is aware to, right. to come. Right, it's just so important that we don't lose sight of its people who keep people safe. That's all I want to say is that we can do all of this work, and, and but we can't lose sight of that. And it's not any one person's responsibility. It's all a shared responsibility we have. So I, I definitely don't want to walk away tonight thinking that if we price things out and put these things in place that um, you know per perhaps we've delayed and slowed down but it's not the you know one response you know and I think we have to be really really clear otherwise people will get in two camps on this and and I, I don't want the community to get divided in trying to move together collaboratively on what's best um, so being thoughtful once you see the cost, once you see maybe how, what a phasing could look like, uh, and to continue to, somebody said it already, attend our meetings because the board needs to have the input of people that are here um, and of others so the community can make a decision if they, if, when they see a separate article. but. Um, we have to make sure we always go forward knowing that there's other pieces that need to happen as well. And the mental health piece is uh, an, an example of that. And so let's move up first stage on maybe some pricing, but let's not lose sight of the human resources that we need to think about too. And on that note. Okay. Yeah. You know, the only meetings the credential committee meetings we've had because this is the third year i'm on the board this is the only conversation that has brought other people to the meeting i feel like we have operated in a vacuum since i've gotten back on the board three years ago i don't see people at meetings giving feedback in our budget work sessions the last two years i think brad from rec department showed up at budget work sessions when he could we have literally, we have literally, we are operating with no public sitting in the audience, um, which is, I think you have a responsible board. I like the board I'm on. We're very responsible. I think we do the right thing. But there could come a day where you have board members that aren't doing the responsible thing and you'll get a shock, you know. Because I, I think it's very important the community keep watching us and helping yeah. us and guiding mm -hmm. us. And I thank the people that turned out. Mm -hmm. I, I think the principals being here and hearing this, I think it's fantastic. And I think it's a two-way street, too. We need to get the communication out there as well to them, to let them know it's not just this piece in the budget. You know, mm -hmm. Grant works very hard. Everyone works very hard on these budgets. Yes. And the principals think diligently what they're going to put in these budgets as well and ask right. for. And so people, if they want to come, come. And we need to... Um, put that information out there about when it is and when they can come and to speak to it or send an email and this is how you can reach us okay. for input as well. Okay. Just be the police station across from every school. And <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. okay. Well, yes. The next item will be our future agenda yes. items. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you so you much for coming. Thank appreciate you. appreciate Thank your you. report. Our next meeting, actual PC meeting. It's work session, isn't it? Budget work session. That's January budget work 20th. session. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so that's January 20th. Mm -hmm. right. So budget will be a big so conversation at your 
January and February meetings. Do we have enough time to discuss yeah. such a needy subject? Have we got enough meetings planned? Because I can see people showing up. I can see this conversation taking all night at one of the budget board sessions. Well, I think I think if it's if we've got the information out there that we're that we're talking more about it, I think we're going to get some additional input. Plus, these budget meetings really should only be now focused on a smaller piece. I mean, follow-on should be part of our normal PC meetings or right. and or part of some se separate committee. This will be a piece of the budget work sessions, but you'll have your typical budget work session with your staffing right. and your enrollment. And you'll have Three all, your, all of your budget work sessions. You'll be up late nights. But I think on any budget meeting, clearly, as far as it go security goes, we're focused on just the pieces that we've authorized grant, right. grant to. Correct. Right. Anything else then is, is part of a normal PC meeting or right. something right. else. That's why I was, I was trying but to distinguish when the next come. PC meeting was right. versus the budget. I can't, I just, I can't remember off the top of my head when the next yeah, it's the actual PC meeting. The, huh? the thing that's helpful about that point that Marla made was when people see your competing goods, you know, your competing needs, that's another important piece for mm -hmm. people to understand because um, you know if you go down the list of some of the things you talked about tonight it could be quite costly mm -hmm. they, they prioritizing from what we saw uh, at the conference Thank you. we're under some very tough budget I think it's going to be a tough budget Correct. year. Yeah. I think this will be one of the years we may yeah. get people out in amounts when they see the <laughs> amount that the budgets <laughs> might get socked. I mean, right. where the state We've been levels are. Kentucky the last but few years. It's this year we got like the belt buckle out. I think. <laughs> I just want to make sure. I mean, uh, you know, I'm about, I mean, it's part of the budget discussion, but I mean, is is have we kind of obligated us to say this is what we want? No, I just heard it as I mean, I we we're going to sure. have pricing. I mean, of these I mean, are that's, all, that's all I was trying to say was that we're right. just pricing it out. We don't. I mean, well, I know he, that's what he was asking for. Those two gentlemen took it that I'm the right. only <laughs> one against putting the money in. Mm -hmm. And I don't think they understood that what you're looking at is the dollars coming back and making a decision. Oh, right. mm -hmm. So how they heard it, mm -hmm. I look like the only ogre that might say that I already look negative because I want to study some of this first. And you I know? thank you for doing that. But at yeah. the same time, it was also it's put out there that the community quiet. is going <laughs> to vote for the budget. And if it's not passed, then it's a no-go. Or the anyway. special article. Right, the special yeah. article. And if there is a special article. Right. So there's that as well. Right. That hasn't even been. I mean, that's still down the line yet to decide if that's what's going to happen. I mean, that's all part of the budget right. discussion. Right. Well, that shows your planning, right. at least. Here's an avenue. Still want to join us, Matt? <laughs> <laughs> you can still appoint him tonight. <laughs> I'm so glad you were here, at least, to, you know, get an understanding of, you can't just lock the door. You know, I'm sitting there thinking, how can I make that immediate? I can't make it immediate. I mean, it's funny you say that, immediate. but you could. If, if tomorrow, something drastic happened, Tomorrow, the governor can say, or any can say, you lock that front door. Yeah. And so, prepare to deal with that, right? So, we could. It's just a question of, you know, okay. Well, you couldn't. You'd have to put it in the system. We don't have the system to lock the door tomorrow. Sure. You can lock the front door. You can lock it. Yeah. It's just that well, you have saying, to but walk right, open right. and open the door so, you know, the, anytime somebody right. knocks right. on it. And, and, and it could come, if something happened right. tomorrow, the next day, they might come and tell you, you've got to lock that front door. And everything's manual. So, and now, yeah. we can't prepare for that. Right. But we should start preparing for the days our doors are locked by whether we do that yeah. next month next year right I, that's something because that's a policy thing that's going to the way policy goes that's going to take years to get everything yeah. but uh, as we're talking about future agenda items 
we know we're going to have a budget work session, but isn't there going to be some daily or some housekeeping things we're going to have to do? There's a negotiations committee meeting. There's right. policies be being right. decided on. We got leaders at work that's got to do some work on the superintendent's evaluation. And quite frankly, from what I saw happen at CCSU and what's been going on, I want to have that conversation as a PC because I need to know as your rep, do you want me going in at CCSU level as a representative? To me, the last meeting kind of went off, kind of surprised me. It, it was a very surprising meeting and um, I think for some of the policies and some of the things we're going to do, I'd like to have some of that stuff as a conversation at PC before I walk right. into CCSU meetings, so I'm very clear on this board's guidance. So should we have, uh, I mean, should, should we still have task team updates to start the next meeting? Yeah. Oh, for the budget, the budget, budget just session? because the next actual meeting isn't until yeah. later. I mean, you know, negotiations will have had, I think we're, we'll probably have had two or three meetings at that point. Yeah. Plus, plus if we're doing the... Um, There's no uh, January meeting? Uh, uh, it's budget work session. Yeah. Oh, we're doing the... Uh, the uh, no, why am I drawing a blank on, on what we're trying to do with negotiations? The, the Unified big things agreement. and then the little bit, right. the, 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 uh, the small the groups, the small approval. groups, so, yeah. and so yeah. there would be some out, uh, mm -hmm. you know, sharing of what's what's occurred what there. Mm -hmm. You know that that Dave and I don't would necessarily have participated in. And right. So I'm just looking at, at still having that as maybe part of the the initial the, the next um, mm -hmm. budget work session. I, boy, I really think that's important. Um, the test team updates because. But the, other, but the other thing, you, when you mentioned the SU thing, is uh, we're not going to do it right now, but between you two, you're going to have to decide who wants to be on uh, SU, right? Do we have any more meetings yet this year, or are we done with the SU? Oh, yeah, yeah we have January. Because yeah, superintendent's you're not, you're not on it anymore, so we'll need a, somebody to replace that spot. Right. Yeah. Rest of for it. <laughs> so Unless we want to just put the new person on it, you know, <laughs> <laughs> whoever that is, <laughs> make him vice chairman. <laughs> <laughs> so I just, I mean, not, we don't have to make that decision. I mean, it could be, it could be done later on. Still, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, but that's that's, I guess, the biggest thing I had for future agenda items. Was so we're going to have an appointment too. So it'll be. <laughs> Right, and that, that'll have to be on there. Direct department appointment? No, the no. board appointment. The board. The board appointment. We'll either have to do that that night or a phone I thought we'd be ha probably having a special right. or, meeting, yeah. and now that we've talked this safety issue, I'm thinking is the work budget sessions enough for a conversation? I, I would kind of like to hear back from Grant and have something that's just a board meeting with that as a conversation to hear what Grant is pulling together. And yeah. that's up to you and Judy and Dave yeah. when mm -hmm. you agenda yeah. plan. Right. Okay. But I'm not against an extra meeting in January. I'm I'm feeling like Is that enough time? Uh, yeah. It's not, not to me it's not enough time. We're gonna get into budget and then be hassling over dollar bills yeah. instead of yeah. policy and you know, Paul might have to look at policies and see how that's going to change. Well, and I think when we reduce the number of meetings to accommodate more CCSU meetings, one mm -hmm. of the things we said was if we need an extra meeting, we put in an extra right. meeting. Right. So the question, too, is what kind of meeting? Do you want, like, a hearing? Do you want to work with heart and soul to get sort of a community event? Um, so that you hear from a broader base. Are we talking about the school safety? Yeah. yeah. The, okay. Do it like a forum. <laughs> like, like a forum, big forum to for, for a point. Have people <laughs> come out and discuss it. I, I think it? you'll have yeah because I think you'll have dollar amounts for things, but I don't know if we know what this community has prioritized. I think I heard lock the front doors loudly and clearly. Yeah. Um, but I don't know, as far as the other pieces, what a strategic plan will look like moving forward. And I think it would just be helpful to broaden 
um, you know, your your community. And Heart and Soul does a great job of convening right. um, groups and having the conversation that's facilitated. So you did a good job tonight hearing all voices that wanted to be heard. Um, because I, you know, I, I'm not sure that the other part of the community that will, as you mentioned, where you put a, talked about a camera at EJRP came right. out. Right. I mean, tonight you heard from well, a group that wants one thing. But right, and that group was you know, your has principals a, has, a, has a who manage has a bit more groups. organization than perhaps the other group 